We're on. My mic is on. Come. Welcome um, to day three of Experimenter Curators Hub, the eighth edition. Um, those of you who have been returning, um, this is the last sort of roundup. Um, so um, thank you for staying through the three days. We do see this continuity as an um, inherent value to this format. So uh, thank you for your time. Um, and those of you who are joining today, um, I'm going to do just a, a short um, sort of uh, brief on some of the points that have been discussed um, yesterday by our presenters. Um, and also a way to lead us into a sort of concluding discussion which will take place um, after the third uh, presentation of today. Um, so Josh, can I see? I'm not sure how many um, made it to see the, the blood moon last night. I missed it. Um, but sort of thinking of that moon and to wake us up a little bit, um, I wanted to show you this um, this image of a sun bearing Pari um, riding on a composite lion. And I was thinking also of um, the four headed sphinx um, that Obul uh, showed us, and sort of this idea also um, of finding value in composite thinking and composite being, and of a sort of a planetary alliance. Um, so, what are these kind of modes of um, hybridity, plurality um, that we can sort of think through? Um, within a uh, cosmological uh, being, but also forms of entwinement between sort of human animals and monstrosities. Um, this, this miniature just sort of represents uh, the conjunction of the sun with the constellation Leo. Um, but in, I'm, I'm just sort of showing you this, uh, this 18th century work uh, simply as a sort of starting point. Um, also because Kavita Singh is the expert and she's sort of amidst us today, um, so also sort of to move a little bit from the contemporary um, into different forms of image making. Yesterday, um, Prasad uh, Shetty and Rupali Gupte um, started by uh, informing us of how their, their research and their sort of exercises in looking at um, urban development um, and urban forms of the city uh, dwells on the corroded edges and the blurs, the lines uh, the lines of movement, the sort of degrees um, of informal economy and the corporate capitalism and where they basically intersect uh, within, within us as sort of um, city dwellers, um, while also sort of thinking about the more hidden aspects of transactional capacities and the affective substance of kinship and care that must run against the logic of cellularization of life, of what it means to invent guerrilla tactics of survival, and address um, an address towards maintaining porosity, not only in the <coughs> architecture, they showed us this sort of house as this forest house, an example in Bombay, but how may we achieve that? And this is the sort of question uh, that, that needs to be thought through further, of course, through some of the kind of uh, discussions that came up. How do we think about this porosity um, as a possibility at a communal level um, within the kind of social disparities that prevail? Um, Luli, who is going to present today, uh, has been also asking uh, potent questions from the audience, and today he will have a chance to speak and share his practice with you. Um, but some of those questions were on how to mobilize the potential of moving beyond nation-based territoriality through the grammar of the archive in terms of its construction, in terms of its access, um, and also in exhibition making such that there isn't simply a consumptive relation toward indigenous inclusion and indigenous sovereignties um, as sort of position as formal sort of figureheads of practice um, under the pressure of political correctness, but instead to rupture the ontological framework and to really think about more sustained networks in which um, indigenous knowledge can circulate um, and, and, and truly not thinking about it as a marginal practice because it, it, it is not. Uh, and it is the power dynamics that actually sort of push it at those edges. Um, from which it must fight uh, each time. Um, Oval uh, also encourages us to think about curating as a form of resilience um, and thought through what sort of immune systems we need to build today, um, which includes uh, modes of solidarity. Um, and she 
encouraged us in her projects uh, also to think through queerness as a mode of opaque alliance, to think about that queerness across different generations of practice, um, as she has. Uh, Jubesh sort of also prompted uh, to move, if we have to move beyond sort of opacity and transparency in terms of glissance thinking, um, and within the, in, within the context in India, uh, what are the graded thresholds of illegibility, illegibility in which um, we exist and which inform um, our, our existence and, and its unevenness? Um, Oval also shared um, some compelling practices. So I'd mentioned the artist Gulsun Kar Kara Mustafa, whose work um, you know, you're, you're encouraged to sort of look into, um, and also what it has meant to commission projects within the public space of Istanbul. Um, with uh, artists such as Banush and Nitoglu, whose project, The List, is something that is in constant progress and sort of talks about um, the, the realm of displacement uh, and dispossession as not something that is seen within the kind of limit of a refugee crisis, a refugee crisis, but literally something that is um, happening from a much longer uh, time span and within a much larger geography. Um, and how we are all basically uh, responsible and in it. And what it means then to sort of broadcast that uh, across different formats, to stream that um, on uh, the Yama screen, which is in the middle of Istanbul, now closed under political pressure, um, and currently this project being in Liverpool, as she cited. Um, Adam Shumshik is, uh, has been with us now for the second time. And we discussed Documenta 14. Um, sort of a member from the audience brought up how it is an exhibition that um, has been termed as exhausting by design, um, mm -hmm. what it actually means to be in exhibitions that can be informative, uh, transform uh, transformatory grounds, but at the same time also um, deeply exhausting, what it actually, if we even want to make that effort in the times we are in, um, where there are different priorities, so how must the exhibition also wrestle for attention and at the same time um, for us as, as, as curators to not uh, submit or surrender to the pressure of thinking about audience figures within mega exhibition formats um, and the audience as, as a scheme of numbering um, and a, as a sort of taxonomy as such. Um, this also then, um, this kind of defying of those pressures obviously has also repercussions which we basically know um, uh, our, our, our surrounding um, this, the, the narrative of this exhibition. But what we wish to do uh, was to also share with you the process of making it and the many channels through which um, it circulated, which was, as Adam mentioned, the public exhibition site, radio, television, the website, and the various publications, some of which are also um, accessible online. The Parliament of Bodies was another sort of ground of thinking through what kinds of publics um, can be produced um, as open form constituencies that are in shift, um, and how to move away from streams of hypercirculation. This is something we were asking ourselves, and disengaging with the artistic practice as a generic roll call of names. Um, and this is Adam sort of thinking what it means to take on the curatorial task of becoming familiar with that which is not known to you rather than that which has been established as part of your curatorial signature um, and how it is within that moment that that fragility is basically um, the kind the, the key condition what does it mean to think about producing um, an exhibition such as documenta as a seriality of fragile moments um, along with a, a large team um, and to choose to speak from the position of we. We've also talked about um, how artistic and cultural practitioners um, are not only performing within infrastructure, but are becoming infrastructure themselves in a lot of different contexts. Um, and I'd cite um, Erin Gleason's work in Cambodia and a lot of um, our other work that also happens within the sort of um, the informal life of art, um, where, where becoming infrastructure is basically um, how practice is enabled. Uh, Bonaventure and the work they do at Savvy Contemporary um, is one such infrastructure um, informed by corporal literacy, so also um, body knowledge and body thinking in an expanded way. Uh, Bonaventure shared projects that he has done um, which are associated intrinsically with the thinking and practice 
of, um, of musicians uh, such as Julius Eastman, mu musician composers such as Julius Eastman and Halim al um, who's also a scholar, of course, and sort of looking at um, a certain kind of um, African cosmopolitanism um, and, and thinking about music um, in a certain way where he says, for instance, the world is not legible, but it is audible. What does it mean to um, deal with acts of de-erasure against the amnesia of institutional memories when these sort of thinkers are basically written out uh, for in various ways such that a different history of minimal music evolves? And how can, they, um, how can we become kind of engrossed in their practice, um, not as a history, but as a sort of continuing composition in our times? Um, and I'd conclude also um, with the fact that, you know, since we have a lot of practitioners who um, are here, who are living between places, we're sort of living between the cracks um, and are diasporic. Um, it's a condition that is sort of also uh, coming out of various uh, political urgencies to sort of become uh, a diasporic practitioners. And so due to this as well, um, decide uh, Fred Morton and sort of Glissant in thinking about moving away from the heroic radical singularity, um, which is also the condition when one thinks of oneself having a very specific um, territorial makeup, um, to think otherwise, to think about a, the consent not to be a single being, and what that actually means in terms of our proliferation of our thinking um, and our impact. So with that, um, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Kavita Singh, uh, who is a professor of art history and dean at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU, um, where she teaches courses on the history of Indian painting, on curating, and on the history and politics of museums. She has published extensively uh, with essays ranging from issues on colonial history to repatriation, secularism and religiosity, fraught national identities and memorialization of difficult histories as they relate to museums in South Asia and beyond. Her writing has always been complemented by a wide range of discursive formats and of exhibition making. Um, and we've, or a lot of us, uh, have, have studied under her in different ways. And this is also thanks to her generosity as an organizer uh, beyond the sort of uh, university context um, and, and sort of really being um, key in terms of also working across different generations of practitioners. There are some young curators from CISA, uh, which Koch and Gilt Institute organize, and Kavita has been also key within those formats. Um, so thank you uh, so much for being there for all of us, um, and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to express my... Yeah. Any of you like to go inside? Yeah, do you want a better seat? Also, uh, the people who come in late can let you just. Can you raise your hands? Make sure you get the seat. This side, that side, where you like. Come down, come down. Come down. You keep your hands. So, this is a good moment for a mic check. Am I audible? No? Oh. What should I do? It's not that. It's on. In fact, I can hear a bit of an echo. Is it OK? Can you hear at the back? And the rustling sound, is it your chairs or is it my clothes? I'm not sure. OK. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't stay in place. So, yeah. Um, hello, hello, good morning, one, two, three. Worse, okay. No, but that's only if I look in that direction. Uh, okay, what if I do this? No, that won't work. Okay, now. But I'll be looking up. Is it catching my voice? Yeah. yeah? OK, great. OK, thank you. OK, let me start by expressing my gratitude. I'm so delighted to be here. 
uh, not least because I'm a big fan of Experimenter and the projects you do and the artists you show. So I'm really very chuffed to that I'm on your radar at all. <laughs> I'm no, I'm really, really like you know. I, I I feel it's uh, like I'm excited that you even thought of calling me. I also am very, very excited to be here because of Natasha, because although we can't afford to do that really, but because I have the mic right now, I'm going to take part of the credit for what she is, because she was our student. And even if she, you know, she is what she is, but we are so delighted to be able to make some small claim on her, because she passed through our doors. I mean, yeah, so, you know. It's really exciting. Of course, Natasha is not the only person. I'm not going to now start naming the many luminaries who are in this room, whom we can all kind of like say, you know, like I knew him before he was famous. So that's one of the great benefits of teaching uh, in an institution. Um, it's been very stimulating for me the last couple of days, particularly because so much of what has gone before what I'm going to say has a huge contrast with the case study that I'm going to present for you. And I think the sharpest uh, contrast came actually in Erin Gleason's presentation, which, as Natasha was saying, showed us how a number of artists or academics or activists actually find themselves in a situation where they have to be infrastructure. There is no infrastructure, but there is a desire, a thirst, a passion, a sense of mission. And you just force into being, just by will, that which you want to see in existence in the world, because there is nothing to support it. And what I'm going to speak about, actually, is the exact inverse of that situation, where we have an infrastructure, we have an institution, we have funds, we have collections, and we have no will within them. And what happens in that kind of situation? Uh, I, oh, OK. Uh, which is our, we are all our museums, but I'm going to take us into the museum that I know well, because I live in the city that is unfortunate enough to be blessed with its presence, the National <laughs> Museum in Delhi, right? So why the National Museum can't? And the sentence is incomplete, because why can't it? Pretty much anything it should do. Why can't it do any of those things? Why can't it? keep its collections well? Why can't they document them? Why can't they make information about what they have public? Why can't they serve an educational function? Why can't they be what they're supposed to be? It is an incredibly frustrating, depressing, and disturbing thing for us to see how the museum is sunk in this kind of morass. It's something that was started in 1948, fresh with all the ideals of a uh, newly independent country, and it has turned into this morgue for art. And it's sunk into this morass for all kinds of reasons. I can't go into all of them. There's, of course, the usual bureaucratization. There is something about the quality of the human resource being what it is, which is not accidental. I think it is as poor as it is by design. There is an institutional design for it. Um, it's also because there is a very peculiar notion built into our governmental employment systems about what is accountability. And so we are only accountable for the mistakes we make or the damage we do. We are not held accountable for not doing anything. So when a position was actually open in the National Museum and one of the curators asked me to apply and he says, you know the great thing, Kavita, if you get the job, you never have to work again. <laughs> this is a curator in the National Museum who is selling this position to me because the safest thing to do is to not do anything at all once you have the job because if you don't do anything, there is no chance of making mistakes. So that has become the default option for how our institutions are working. And of course, there is a tremendous pressure of politics within the institution. Now, this is the National Museum. It's a stone's throw from the parliament. It's a stone's throw from the ministry building. So of course, there is a macro politics. And the way that actually plays a part, or it builds a pressure on what the museum is supposed to do, what it's supposed to represent, how it's supposed to represent, what are the limits on what it can say. But of course, within the institution, there is the micro politics as well. And the micro politics can have a more deadening effect than the macro politics because a minister can tell you x has to be done but if deputy keeper doesn't want it to be done deputy keeper can find three reasons to hold up the project right and the micro politics that happens when you have a whole bunch of people who are not very good at their job or not very keen on their jobs 
that can really affect even those two, three, four people who have accidentally been hired who are actually good and keen, right? So it has a deadening kind of effect all in all. Now, how this kind of plays up within the institution, we know it's a kind of permanent state of stasis, but I'd like to tell you how it plays up when some of us, through various circumstances at particular moments in the history of the institution, wander in as guest curators, and we try to make something happen. Now, of course, when an occasion like that arises, it is because there is some pressure from many powerful institutions to force this institution to actually host something, to make something possible, you know, to start some uh, project or exhibition which injects life into the institution. So one instance that I want to talk about is a very recently concluded exhibition called India and the World, uh, History in Nine Stories, which was a joint project between some Indian foundations, I'll tell you in a minute who, and the British Museum. So there's this British Museum, which is this very big universal museum. And as a universal museum, it's coming under a lot of scrutiny and pressure and criticism nowadays for what does your universal mean, you know? And whom does your universal include? Is it not just a colonial museum, which is calling itself universal to make itself feel good? So some of the things that were instituted under this very visionary director that the uh, British Museum had, Neil McGregor, was to try and think about the logics and the ethical premise of a universal museum today. And part of it was the sharing of collections. So to take the uh, universal collections of the universal museum and move them around to other locations which don't have privy to these very broad ranging historical collections from different civilizations. And they struck a working relationship with the largest museum in Mumbai, the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale, uh, or as I like to say, the museum formerly known as Prince, because it used to be the Prince of Wales Museum. So, uh, in that, okay. so they had this deal going where they would have an exhibition in which various Indian collections, primarily the National Museum, would lend a lot of material from Indian history, and it would be juxtaposed with objects from world history from the British Museum collections. And the two co-curators who were uh, put in charge of developing the narrative and the, you know, the, the way the museum, the exhibition flowed were someone called J.D. Hill, who is the head of research in the British Museum, and my colleague Naman Ahuja, who teaches at JNU and has curated a number of uh, very remarkable exhibitions. So they do this exhibition in Mumbai. And uh, some of the canonical objects actually are lent by the British Museum to this manifestation in Mumbai, like this Roman copy of a very famous Greek sculpture that comes, that's installed in the central rotunda, sort of uh, informing the Mumbai audience even before they come into the exhibition that the greatest hits of art history are in your town. And then you go into the exhibition and there's a very interesting series of juxtapositions, what Naman I think very nicely called objects in conversation, where you have two things that are sort of manifestations of a similar impulse, but which find different form in different cultures and civilizations. It's a large exhibition, I won't go into it, but you see here the staging of two um, pillar fragments which come from Persepolis over here, and you see how they are presented. You have, let's say, a gallery that talks about maritime trade along the Indian Ocean, and you have all kinds of uh, objects in cases, objects that were traded across the seas. And you have a very nice graphic on the floor which places the vitrines inside the blueprint of a boat. So you have a sense of this movement and this ceaseless interchange that happens. So of course, this is an exhibition that is not just looking at a world history of art, but at how the world was in conversation through history and how objects actually can help to track these historical conversations. And um, yeah, a section at the end when Aman goes all philosophical as he is wont to do, where he talks about the nature of time and whether it's cyclic or linear. And he had a range of interesting objects which uh, show different people's visualizations of uh, time itself. Right? So the exhibition in Mumbai was gorgeous, as I think you could see from the couple of slides I've brought you. Uh, it brought a very large number of objects in 
to display but also into conversation with each other. The text was very astute. It was also interlayered with a lot of videos where you had curators of different kinds speaking about the works and how they relate to each other. And the exhibition was also occasion for a series of events including many walkthroughs, some of which I think very interestingly for an Indian museum brought a lot of attention to the design of the exhibition. Because here you have an invitation card for a walkthrough by the exhibition designer who was an architect based in Mumbai called Brinda Sumaya. And just next to it you have another uh, invitation card for a walkthrough which was being done by I think his name is Dhruvajyoti Ghosh who was the lighting designer and the lighting also played a huge role in the effectiveness of this exhibition. Now when the exhibition was mounted in Mumbai, a lot of us didn't bother to book our tickets to Mumbai because we said of course National Museum has lent so many works, it's going to come to Delhi as well. And Naman said don't be so sure, so some of us had the good sense to actually dash across and see the exhibition over there. Because once the exhibition actually did decide to travel to Delhi and this was done belatedly and in a hurry, what we actually saw of the exhibition in Delhi made us sort of deeply regret that it had ever made the move at all. Because, oops, I've gone one back in front of forward. Because when the exhibition comes to Delhi, I mean, I just have to show you the inauguration function and the people on the dais for you to get the picture, right? So up there we have the inaugural function in the National Museum Auditorium in which there is like someone from the Ministry of Culture, there's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there's the director of the National Museum. Where is Mr. Navana, who's the really dynamic curator? He's in London. And he's in London that day, I think. I mean, he says it's a long standing commitment that he had, but we're among friends here, right? So he's in London because he's so upset because he's written out of the exhibition. When the contract is drawn up by the CSMVS to travel the exhibition to the National Museum, they don't have any place for Naman at all in their plan. No? They don't have a budget for him. He doesn't exist. And when he says, uh, what is my role in this exhibition, they say, now you've done your work. We don't need you anymore. And what about the lovely lighting designer and the lovely uh, exhibition designer who have already engaged with these objects, already have a deep understanding, already have a lot of materials ready that can be picked up and put in the place. We don't need them also because we have our own in-house expertise. So we are going to do fine without any of you. Thank you very much. And this is the exhibition that they produce. I mean, I cannot, you know, unfortunately, there's something about the phone cameras which don't, they make everything look good. You know, they make your food look good. Um, they make you look good. They're even making this wretched exhibition look not as bad as it was. It was horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Right? Uh, it was crowded. It was messy. I'm just going to show you a close up of this case for you to see the fabulous lighting design. Right? <laughs> All you could see are these crappy cases with their horrible thick joints and the lights just casting shadows on the object. It was unbelievably bad. It was so shabby. The walls were peeling. The exhibit labels had stuff that was wrong, which just had sticky tape on it to obscure things. I mean, it was just, oh, it, you know, and, and the logic of the exhibition, the flow, the relationship between the text and the object, all of that was lost. And it didn't have to be. They had something ready in Mumbai. They just didn't want to maybe pay a little extra to get those people to come into work for two weeks to adapt the design to the Delhi galleries. And they thought that what they are doing is good enough. You know? This is absolutely extraordinary to me. Now, in addition to the badness of the design, there were also some very interesting exclusions in the exhibition. The number of things did not travel. Right? Yeah. So. Um, the Discobolus didn't come, the British Museum didn't want to travel it and because that didn't come this uh, work by a Chinese contemporary artist which was a take on the Discobolus full size uh, version of him wearing a Mao suit that made no sense so that didn't come either right and then this uh, very celebrated contemporary sculpture by Ellen Talur which uh, plays with the historical form of the Natraj and embeds it in concrete uh, and money, that didn't come either and neither were these Japanese scrolls on display. These are just some of the things. I think there were 12 or 14 objects that were not on display in Delhi which had been on display in Mumbai. So the Discobolus, it seems that the British Museum didn't want to lend it for that long. That didn't come. 
as Meera Menezes, who's here with us today, wrote in a very sharp uh, article, a number of these um, exclusions seem quite significant. And unlike other journalists who just commented on it, Meera actually sort of pursued the director until he made a statement about why it hadn't come. And he said, <laughs> yeah. so he said, we, oh, I love this, we, the professional heritage lovers. Right? So, uh, we know what professional lovers are, so we are professional heritage lovers. Should not trivialize the Anand Tandav of Lord Shiva, who is the embodiment of the caustic underpinning, having creation arising from his drum, protection from the hand of hope, destruction from the hand holding fire, foot held aloft giving release. It, this version may be a significant artwork by the artist, but in the context of history and culture, it is against the depiction of the Nataraj, right? So this is ideological censorship, right? So Mia has even a further postscript to add, but we can go into that later, she can share with us. But this is the reason the director of the National Museum gives for excluding a work of art that he just doesn't think it's respectful enough to Indian culture. Another set of objects that was not over there was actually these Japanese scrolls. So amazingly, you go past this case which has a Chinese scroll. This is in the <coughs> gallery of court culture. So you have this Chinese scroll. And you come up on this big case. And in that case, suddenly there are two framed Mughal prints from the gift shop in tacky <laughs> frames with the printed captions showing. And you're like, why is this here? And you ask Naman. And Naman tells you it was supposed to have these two Japanese scrolls, which had actually traveled to Delhi for the show. But the National Museum had painted the inside of the case so recently that the fumes were still in there. So the conservator said, you cannot show our scrolls in there. So they just you know, had an empty case. They just slapped something. A museum that has like a million objects of its own. It just slapped two things from the gift shop in there. And most beautiful is that the curator's video explaining the Japanese scroll was running alongside <laughs> for the whole duration of the show. Right? So this is going on. OK. So <laughs> and ha, this lady. So those of you who are not from India wouldn't know how important she is in our history. So there's this third millennium to second millennium BC civilization, which we are all very proud of, but it has very little figurative sculpture. And one of the figurative sculptures that was produced, which survives, is this tiny little bronze figure, uh, which has been called a dancing girl for no good reason. I won't go into that. Naman has a theory about that as well. <laughs> but this was on display in the Bombay exhibition. Now, in the Mumbai exhibition, they had a replica. The object belongs to the National Museum. OK, they think it's too precious to travel even to Mumbai. They don't show it. They ask the uh, Mumbai Museum to put up a replica. They put up a replica. What do they do in Delhi? This is a photograph from a textbook. Gives you an idea of the original object. Take a good look. And this is what they put up in Delhi. Yeah? A replica and a worse replica. <laughs> Like, apparently they had offered this to Mumbai and when Naman saw it, he said, I'm not showing this. So they hunted around for someone who had bought a replica in the 1950s, so it was at least better quality and they put that up. In Delhi, they put up this hideous thing and please don't miss that blob of blue tack. Blue tack in her crotch. I mean, what are we doing? What is the National Museum doing? I I don't have words. I just don't have words for the, you know, the thinking in this museum. So, Mia, you wrote about the censorship of the big uh, sculpture, but there's also the bikini put on our dancing girl. It's so, also censorship. I mean, I'm just aghast, right? Now, not only do they do this, but I know that everyone in the museum actually has really had their knives out for Naman. 
because they are so resentful of his international success, his cosmopolitanism, the fact that he is the one who gets these, they have the objects, but he gets to be the curator. So that's partly why, not partly, that's mainly why they would have left him out of the exhibition in the first place. Also because he has very high standards where installation is concerned and they certainly didn't want him butting in on their very highly competent uh, uh, capacities, right? So, yeah, <laughs> the professional lover as, uh, as opposed to the amateur lovers, right? Okay, <laughs> so, so here we have it. Now, this is how it plays out when an outside curator comes to the National Museum, right? So three years ago, a friend and I got a chance to do something in the National Museum and we knew all the problems that are likely to come. So we tried to tiptoe around them. Now what was this chance that we got? Uh, three years ago, we got the opportunity to mount an exhibition which was also from the National Museum's collections and it was an exhibition uh, called Norus, the Many Arts of the Deccan. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. Uh, my friend Preeti Bahadur Ramaswamy and I were the co-curators and this was an exhibition which had objects entirely from the National Museum's collection but we stepped in to do selections, to make a narrative, to produce the texts you know, and to oversee the design and so on but with uh, cooperation from the museum. Um, these are some of the um, galleries of the exhibition. It had different kinds of materials. We had a lot of textiles. We had arms and armor. We had metalware. We had fabulous manuscripts. I'll show you a few of them as we went on. And the reason for that exhibition was actually this exhibition, which is a spectacular, show-stopping exhibition that was mounted at the Metropolitan Museum in 2016 on the art of the Deccan. Now what is the Deccan? The Deccan is the northern peninsular part of India and it is an area in which there were some sultanates ruling, I mean, there were many obviously polities at many times but there is a period from about the 14th century to the 18th century when there are these sultanates that are ruling and that uh, are fighting with each other all the time so borders are constantly shifting, the Mughals want to conquer them so there is constant warfare on the northern front. And there is a tremendous amount of trade because of the coastline. There is a tremendous amount of production of beautiful objects which actually helped India in the 18th century to uh, corner 25 percent of the world's international trade economy. So there is a lot that is going on in the Deccan at this time and yet because it is a time and a place which has a great deal of movement a great deal of fighting, a great deal of immigrants where you have elites from Persia, from Central Asia, from Ethiopia becoming important rulers and commanders in this area. It is also something that doesn't fit into a national narrative because it's too hybrid, it's too cosmopolitan, there are too many shifting um, cultural zones you know, and force fields over here for it to fit into a neat story as a result of which there has been hardly any scholarship in the area. And so when the Metropolitan Museum under the leadership of the Islamic arts curator Naveena Najat Heather uh, developed a major project to do a big art of the Deccan exhibition, uh, oh no, um, uh, we in India got terribly excited about it and we thought we are not going to get something like that exhibition over here. So let us at least have a conference. So we called Naveena to speak and we called other scholars who work on the Deccan to speak. And while we were planning this conference, which was sponsored by a, a foundation, a private foundation, the lady who runs that foundation, that's Renu Jaj, said, why don't we also do an exhibition along with the conference? Let's ask the National Museum if they have any Deccani objects and let's put them on show. Now it was possible to ask the National Museum because at that moment almost by accident we had Venu, Venu Gopal, this brilliant uh, bureaucrat who for one year shook up the museum and really made it function well. And so Venu actually really made uh, it possible for us to do the exhibition because he was able to then order the curator that they have to cooperate with us. We also had a very important member of our team, there was Orun Das who was our uh, designer. You know, I think one of the wires is not like this, these lines, is it because a wire is loose? No? Okay. 
and for us it was very very important to have the cooperation of the different keepers of the different departments now these are not articulate people these are not people who have social capital these may not even be people who know their objects or their you know the history of their objects terribly well in all cases but we knew we needed them to be on our side otherwise we would be left with little shreds to show in the exhibition so we decided to make them co-authors and to give them credit everywhere so they wrote the catalog entries it's another matter that we had to heavily edit them but we got them to sign all of them we got them to participate in the symposium we got them to lead curatorial walks so that they would feel that they are also included in the process of the exhibition and i think that paid off sorry because they started finding us objects which were just beyond spectacular like this is a 17th century textile tent panel right remember let me have five more minutes because there are objects right five extra minutes so this i mean i don't know those of you who don't know how kalamkari is done it's an absolutely insane process where they have to dye each color so they actually will paint with the mordant which is going to fix the paint rather than the color itself so they are painting maybe in some shades of gray which is what the mordant is and then everything that they don't want to be in that color they have to cover with either mud or wax so that it doesn't get that so you can imagine one bird how many times it has to be mordanted and resisted to produce this and the complexity of this piece i can't begin to tell you so you know the decorative arts curator brought us things like this she found us this 10 meter long embroidered uh, panel from it is embroidered i brought one close up so you can see the number of stitches in it it was like spectacular you know they were taking out these things that we didn't we never thought the national museum would have anything in it that was worth showing in a deccani exhibition and this stuff started rolling out um amazing manuscript a uh, persian translation in the deccan in the 17th century of a 14th century arabic uh, encyclopedia of the universe so starting from the stars and the angels in the sky down to things that are under the depths of the ocean and uh, three four illustrations on every page 500 page manuscript i mean it was just like amazing there were beautiful paintings what we didn't have in the exhibition at all was jewelry because the jewelry curator under repeated pressure from us because we're seeing the deccan had the earliest diamond mines you must have some deccani jewelry but he under pressure poor fellow he didn't know a thing about his department he pulled out some things and we couldn't at all be sure they were from the deccan so we had to exclude all the jewelry because the, we just didn't have the expertise to know right so anyway we saw all the kind of material that they pulled out and preeti and i developed a narrative which had various thematic sections the sections were not by material but by different kinds of historical themes for example the deccan was very no, well known for very inventive metalware so we had a series on speaking objects in which you had um you know some kind of copper and uh, vessels which had amazing engraving and calligraphy yeah i know like it was just amazing the you had uh, a bidriwe hookah base which actually had scenes from the padmavat epic you know that's been in the news so much on it um you had a storyline about how tobacco enters india through the deccan through portuguese traders coming to deccan ecos and so all the technology of smoking that is developed depictions of people who are smoking and how smoking spreads from the elite to the popular levels where you have these women who set up a smoke shop and people are kind of rioting to get to their chance with the hookah right so yeah and then this was about uh, north indian uh, devotees of krishna in the deccan and how they adapt their ritual needs to the available crafts as well as possibly the spread of interest in krishna's uh, going to persian reading people because you have a manuscript of the story of krishna written in persian um we had a whole section this textile so this textile didn't exactly fit the deccan and we said we have to make it fit because we are not having the show without it once we had seen it so we spun this story it's not true untrue but we use a fantastic scholarly essay by someone called philip wagner who talks about the vijayanagar kingdom and how the architecture of the temples was very much in the hindu temple mode but the architecture of the palaces was in the islamic it sultanate mode because the sultanate mode was the language of power in visual culture 
And so we point to how there is a bit of that here as well. So that was a very thin peg on which we managed to uh, get this textile into the exhibition. Right? And the name of the exhibition actually comes from a ruler whose nom de plume was Norras Shah, or the king of the nine rasas. You know, uh, rasa is aesthetic uh, sentiments. And he was a music bad king. And he composed uh, many of the portraits of him, show him uh, actually playing or singing, um, playing instruments or singing. And uh, for us, you know, this um, collection of his songs had a verse which was like our epigraph where he says, our tongues might all be different, but we feel the same emotion. We express the same emotions uh, in, uh, you know, kaha turk, kaha brahman. So whether we are Turkish or whether we are Brahmins. And the person who is truly fortunate is the one on whom Saraswati gives her blessings. Right? So that we are blessed with knowledge and understanding. And the, uh, oops, the frontispiece of the collection of his poems actually has a portrait of Saraswati in it. And he calls himself the son of Saraswati. Right? So here's an Islamic king who calls himself the son of the Hindu goddess of learning, which for us was gold. <coughs> And the National Museum had a few pages from this manuscript, the Kitabi Norras, which has his poem. So we were very proud to display them. And the idea of the cosmopolitanism, the hybridity, the mixing of these cultures, the fact that there is a place where Brahmin and Turk can meet, that became very important for the exhibition. I remind you, this exhibition was mounted in the National Museum in 2015. We had just got our blessed new government in 2014. So this was an important thing for us to be able to do. But that's the exciting part. And then there is also the frustrating, the depressing, the, yeah, the disappointing part, which is the behind the scenes part. So when we're actually handling these objects, um, our designer was designing the exhibition. We had requested the keepers to give us preventive conservation guidelines for how things should be displayed. What are the do's and don'ts for every object? None of that came. When the design was actually presented to them, again, there were no interventions. Orun had wanted to enliven this object by making it turn a corner. I was begging him, not a sharp corner. It's a textile. Let it go gently. So he curved the corner, which is great. But I was in the museum the night that they were mounting this. And this carpenter with grubby <laughs> hands comes with his hammer and starts driving nails oh, here. Uh. And I started saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, oh, I am not actually doing anything to the textile. And he's doing this with his hands. I'm not damaging the textile. I'm only doing the border. Right? And like, so we're begging him, Ki, please, you know, file down a piece of wood, bend this over the support, and put the nails on that piece of wood, you know, which will extend like beyond the width of the Part that you know, we're begging him to do that. I'm, I must say, I actually cried at that moment when I saw him putting his hands on the textile. And it really makes you wonder what is the trade off between you know, our constantly complaining about these things being inside the store, nobody being able to enjoy them, and actually bring them out to be put up by people like this, right? It, it I felt that we had damaged certain things. Um, this. Thing. This was that fantastic encyclopedia. And because we could only show one page at a time, Orun had this idea that we'd show creatures coming out of the um, uh, object and covering the walls. And then, of course, we had an iPad where you could turn the pages. But after three or four days, two or three people started complaining that this very precious uh, manuscript is outside. And it's too flat. It wasn't entirely flat, but it wasn't like this. It was like this. And they said it's going to damage the binding. And the director got spooked and he removed it. You know, so we, ha we put a dummy, we put a digital reproduction for the rest of the show. Um, there were two or three problems, like a painting fell down inside the case and the <laughs> lower edge got damaged. And this is because the fabrication of all the display materials was in the National Museum's hands. And the fabrication was rather poor quality. So you had nice design ideas and it's being marred by sort of plexiglass, which is wavy, which is scratched. You know, So that was also a frustration that you can't actually get the, um, the interaction with the objects that you would have liked. But despite all the problems and all the misgivings, it was still 
a big high to be able to put out an exhibition like that, to be able to talk about hybridity, cosmopolitanism, this kind of cross-pollination, you know, at that time. And we also had a fantastic response from other creative people who came and did concerts, who did storytelling performances. We had a lot of walkthroughs with different people. And there was a fantastic and exciting response and many conversations which built up over that, which made me feel that still, you know, there is something wonderful uh, to be said for projects like this, despite whatever misgivings one might have. Uh, the only um, other doubt that I wanted to share with you is that we were quite conscious of how everything that we are saying about these objects and the cultural context that they come out of is true. The Deccan was cosmopolitan. There were elites from local communities. There were local converts to Islam, but there were also Hindu noblemen who became very powerful. There were Abyssinians who became very powerful. There were Persians who became very powerful. So there is no uh, indigenous Deccani. And it wasn't even the point, right? The Deccan had greater connections with lands across the seas on either side than with uh, what it's territorially connected to, because they were always at war with the guys to their north, right? So there is all of that. Ibrahim Adil Shah, this fantastic sultan who calls himself the son of Saraswati, he exists, right? But also, we have a lot of scholarly work which tells us things that we don't necessarily want in 2015 to be saying in public. So one of the major books that was done on uh, the Deccan actually is this fantastic book that is quite a recent one which talks about power, memory, and architecture, and it talks about contested sites. And it actually talks about what we call reuse in uh, <coughs> historical parlance. But it actually means somebody comes in, breaks down the structures of the previous dynasty, and incorporates bits of that into their own. And so of course, there's that hot button topic over here, which is the destruction of temples, and the use of those stone fragments either in mosques or in palaces of the next um, a dynasty that exerts its power over these places, or sometimes just the conversion of an entire site, which has one meaning, into another site. Now, this we did not talk about in the exhibition. right? And I felt that when we are making certain kinds of public addresses, the way we talk about history and the kind of nuance that we would use to talk about history in an academic setting, they are actually two different things. And I still don't feel sure about how honest I feel about having done that. I'll end here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to pick on uh, two um, questions that we did sort of discuss which aren't, uh, which I find are, are very connected to what is currently going on, certain debates uh, within our context here in India, um, and the ways that uh, people such as Kavita have responded on various forums. <clears throat> and so I'd just like to sort of address those and, and, and request her to, to speak about that to us, and then actually open it up, because we've, uh, we have a whole lot of uh, things to discuss just based on the presentation. So um, one is that there are monuments um, in India, such as the 17th century Red Fort, which is going to be entrusted in care of the cement, a cement company, the Dalmia Bharat Group. I mean, that is the, that is the status against which there was a, a statement written by various members, um, including historians um, and, and cultural practitioners, activists, theater makers, etc. Um, a, a statement released by Sehmat. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure there, are, there have been others uh, outside that circle as well. So how does your work link with the continuing questions of arch like this sort of architectural preservation and heritage management, as it's called? I mean, how, how do we um, create a, a, a kind of a lasting, some sort of lasting resistance to such a move, um, such a kind of drastic move? for a monument that is basically in the capital. So if, if it's so visible and if this could potentially be proposed, then yeah, what just you could share. So 
I actually am a little bit on the side of the arguments that have been uh, in the center of these debates. Because I don't per se think that money in itself is a bad thing. No? Money is a force. And you have to channelize that force in particular ways. Um, I think the government doesn't lack money. That it could easily have made the allocations that it claims these corporations are going to make. Uh, but it chooses not to. Um, the fact that they launched this scheme meant that there was some kind of attention being paid to the area for whatever reason and in whatever flawed way. Almost all of the initiatives taken by this government in the field of education and culture have been deeply flawed. Mm -hmm. But in whatever flawed way, there was a moment of some discussion and some energy around it. And I wish that the discussion had gone into a more productive direction in which we didn't talk so much about who is doing, you know, so who is this businessman to go into the red fort, but to talk about what is being done. Mm -hmm. And if we could have focused on the what is being done, so that we have some respect and value for standards of work, we would have the outcome we want, whether by the government or whether by a corporation, or whether by a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like, look at what the National Museum did to Naman's exhibition. right? They wrote the expert out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in this, you have the government handing over control to a corporation, which is going to do whatever it does in exchange for the permission to add their branding to the site. And the entire transaction was just about that. You give us money, we give you ad space. There was nothing in the discussion, in the guidelines, about what are norms, what kind of expertise do you have to have on board, what can you touch and what can you not touch. There was no professional thinking guiding the initiative, either on the government side or on the private party side. And there is this terrible weakening we have all around you know, of professional standards and the ex expectation of expertise. We've lost it. And we only debate this thing of, is this capitalist, is this socialist, or not. I, I think we are damaging ourselves by shifting the focus just to those terms. And another um, aspect that has become key um, to sort of add to this question of scholarship and the circulation of scholarship beyond the academy, but also beyond certain um, kinds of discursive gatherings um, is something uh, such as the sort of example, if you want to go through that one or mm -hmm. another, of uh, this, this image of Krishna looking into the sky, sort of yeah. read as Krishna looking at the moon. Yeah. And it sort of becomes used as a, as a way to talk about a certain kind of a picture of sort of harmony and unity um, during Eve um, versus uh, Krishna looking at uh, a solar eclipse, which is another reading. Um, and when there is this kind of uh, this social sort of webbing of mm -hmm. expertise versus popular logic versus mm -hmm. a certain kind of celebrity culture also uh, uh, for certain kinds of authors and certain authorial voices. Um, how do you fit into that, and how do you still sort of make you know make yourself heard? Yeah, so this is actually kind of interesting for those of you who don't know. There was an 18th century painting which showed the Hindu god Krishna pointing at the sky, and some people on the left uh, were circulating Can that. Scroll? Do you have a picture uh, of that? We have to go so, online yeah. onto scroll. And and so a and bunch Kavita. of people started circulating that on Facebook and on Twitter as a sign of the harmony that existed at earlier times where the Hindu god Krishna is showing his Muslim yeah, friends. But he, if he finds it on the... Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So this was circulating, you know, just before Eid, this was circulating as a message of communal harmony. Whoever circulated this was naive, you know, because 
I mean, it, it would be a historical. Uh, we can get into a uh, longer discussion about repeated uses in history of the idea of Krishna returning and uh, interacting with historic figures. But uh, somebody said, OK, this is Krishna, and this is a Muslim friend of his, and he's being beneficent and helping him see the Eid moon so that he can break his Ramadan fast. And a whole bunch of people on the other side absolutely howled against it and said that this is inauthentic, it's incorrect, there's absolutely no reason to say this. They were right. It was a misidentification of a scene from the Bhagavad Puran where they're looking for other omens in the sky. But what startled me is the ferocity with which they were denying the idea that there ever has been any kind of friendly, harmonious, civil interchange between a Hindu and a Muslim in history. It's like the entire civilizational history consists of Hindus being killed by Muslims till now when they're able to do the reverse. <laughs> right? So that's what the Twitter verse is saying. And I did try to intervene by writing uh, about it from what I know of this series of paintings and to try and clear some misapprehensions because people were saying it might be fake and I might I was trying to explain why paintings that we don't even know quite where they are right now need not be fake because of contingencies of how paintings are collected and how mm. they circulate and how they hide in collections. That's a, uh, and shortly after we got to know where the painting is, the collection became public. So that's all right. But what was very humbling for me is that for the last, I don't know, 15 years, more than 15 years, I've been studying museums, you know, as this exemplary cultural form, as this authoritative institution, the institution from which a claim is made that truth flows from me, you know, that they produce knowledge. And I've been interested also in seeing how different kinds of groups then want to make museums because the museum becomes that very authoritative source for information. So let's say I've worked on how marginal groups within India have tried to harness even the Holocaust museum form to talk about the traumas of their communities, mm. where it seems that the museum is a very valuable object to possess. right? But when I entered the Twitterverse, I said, man, I'm obsolete. You know, mm -hmm. All my work should just be like thrown in the dustbin. It has absolutely no meaning anymore. Because of the dispersal of the means of communication now, uh, there is no authoritative source. And what you have instead are very, very combative voices which corner the debate mm. in different places. So I've been following a handle called True Indology on Twitter. No, it is just so depressing because he mobilizes the tools of professional history by asking everybody, what is the source? Is this an authentic source? You don't have um, you know, a, a, a historically verifiable source for the claim that you are making. But he's doing that to demolish a lot of the truisms that we have lived by. And I think the academy is yeah. powerless in front of that because it's circulating in its own circle where it's speaking to this ever-expanding group of people who want to hear the doubts that he's raising. Mm. What can we do? You know, I published something in Artibur Sazie. Who's going to read that, Natasha? Mm. Not the people who are following uh, true Indology. W what is the point? I, I don't know. What is the point of the academy today? Hmm. OK, it's on now. Uh, so firstly, it's been a complete pleasure uh, listening to you addressing real practical uh, issues that you face on the ground in terms of putting up a fight uh, with, with mu museums. And s from what I understand, um, uh, you, one of the things that you said in the first, when you started off, was that there was pressure put on these museums to do something, to put up a show. And uh, perhaps. Um, or oh, let me go with this another way. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. But you know, one of the really interesting things you said was that you brought the keepers on board as stakeholders. You made them feel that they were stakeholders, part of this museum, important uh, you know, uh, factors, right? Um, and so I think that's pretty important. So um, what I want to ask you is that what we as the, the Indian public we are stakeholders too of the National Museum, of these public yeah. museums. Yeah. We are the public. 
Um, and it sounds to me that like um, a, f a fight needs to be put up, a, a concerted um, a c countering um, of moribund uh, museums, right? Uh, what do you suggest that the public could do? Well, you know, the pressure that enabled the museum to put up the exhibition at all was a pressure that came from the museum's director who happened to be Venu, right? So there's this fantastic director from Manyon who energizes the place. He gets the keepers to feel that they have to cooperate, otherwise they are in trouble with him. So that was one internal pressure that worked. And so that was a stick, let's say. And then Preeti and I tried to hold out the carrot by making them, as you say, <coughs> stakeholders. And I hope that that was partially the reason why we got such gorgeous objects out of them. There are other wonderful objects we didn't get, which we were told about later. Okay. Uh, but you know, at least we got some nice things for the show. Now, when Venu lost the job, when the prime minister sent him packing uh, from the museum, his parting words to all of us who were the well-wishers, uh, who were really heartbroken that he was going was, it's your museum. Don't give up your claim on it. I may not be there, but don't give up your claim. But actually, that is a utopian statement to make. And those of us who are on the outside, how much can we actually effect? No, we cannot effect very much. So there, uh, there can be you know, some, something which is brought to bear through, I think, in the current situation, more through friendships, you know, friendly overtures rather than criticisms. That might be a better way to go right now. But who wants your friendship also remains to be seen. You can try and see what it gets you. Like you can pitch your perfume idea to the painting curator and see it might get you something. Yeah. Yeah, um, but I, I have an impression that, that the kind of demise of, uh, of museum and, and the moment when the prime minister s sends away yeah. a competent museum director, apparently for political reasons yes. or for whichever reasons there yeah. are, you know, this is part of larger picture of, of the demise of democratic institutions yes. worldwide, you know, and this is not limited to India, Poland or any other country, but basically this sort of competence and passion is being replaced with kind of passion <coughs> less and incompetent. Um, hmm. The decisions that are purely of, of uh, political nature hmm. have nothing to do with the values that you were speaking about. And <coughs> what is even more worrying is that the public voice, so something that you were um, you know, uh, asking for, like, what can we do? Because maybe the answer to the question uh, why we can't is yes, we can, although it mm. might sound, you know, ridiculous. But, uh, but the fact that the, uh, is that the access is barred, so we can have discussions, but we have no right. direct leverage in terms of, you know, the decisions that are taken on appointments, on how such institutions should be structured, how the work should be organized, you know, how internal communication should be going, and so forth. Although we know very well how it could be, you know, we, we, this is not a utopia. This is this is basically within the rich, but it's 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 never reachable mm. in the end. So it's a kind of, I think, that rather um, disheartening moment, which is experienced in many other yes. institutions of society, of yes. which museum is one. If one. you follow the yes. kind of Foucaultian, uh, yes. you know, analysis of, of of various institutions of the kind of post enlightenment um, development, institutional development of societies. And uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm really shocked to hear, you know, such a detailed uh, description or analysis of, you know, the case studies that, that demonstrate what is what is actually happening within the space of the museum, with an example being the museum in Delhi. But I heard about uh, Pyotr Petrovsky in Warsaw as well, right? I mean, so you're right when you say that these kinds of pressures are brought to bear in many locations on many prestigious institutions. Yes, I mean, Piotr Petrovsky uh, proposed a very radical uh, reform, uh, both in terms of program and the kind of administrative structure of the National Museum of Art um, in Warsaw, which was built in 19 um, early 1930s, and, and he had to leave the museum because of his too radical concept of what he called a critical museum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, applied to, to the very holy national museum yeah. of Warsaw. But now again, the situation is different. So after several turns of history, there's again a new director coming who might be not that radical, but he's but at least a good manager and, and very 
you know, okay. competent person in the matters of art history. So, you know, it, it might. I think what's happening in India is there's a kind of an exhaustion with the idea of these holy cows of our big national institutions. And more and more, you have private foundations now muse moving into making their own museums. You know, a collector today in their right mind would not think of donating their collection to a major statal institution. And so they are making a series of modest size uh, institutions of their own. And perhaps the hope is that in 20 years or 30 years, when these sh have energized the situation much more than any public institution, the public institution might be forced to reform themselves. There, there was some uh, question. Sorry, there are that. actually a lot of questions in the room and everybody's sort of, this is a serious sort of classroom situation with like a lot of hands raised like <laughs> me. So we're going to take a, a few uh, questions a all few together. together. Yeah. Uh, Matsushi, Mario, do you have a question? Um, there, okay, I'm going to take people who haven't been sort of uh, speaking much through the days and, and so Matushi, Mario, um, uh, Janvi and, and then we move on to this side and yeah let's see how much time we have. Hi, uh, it's a very interesting presentation. Hi, can I be heard? Yes. Yeah, it's a very interesting presentation and really really glad to hear you. I have a, uh, two simple questions. One is, uh, if the show was in Delhi, why was the original uh, piece not shown of the dancing girl? <laughs> Second question is, uh, if that book uh, had to be removed because of its precarious uh, mm. position of flattening up, then uh, couldn't a digital version be shown uh, where uh, the pages could be just uh, it was. it it was shown and why wasn't the dancing girl the original shown because shall i answer uh, yes. i'm just going to comment about just two minutes i think something very important needs to be told i think kavita knows it br money yes I is say so that. i i yes. think i need to i okay, mean i have spent about, and say it. yeah i spent 20 years working on the archaeological survey of india br money is who's the director of national museum who mira had interviewed is the archaeologist who excavated Ayodhya. So something and you need to know. And he found the Ram Mandir. And he found the Ram Mandir. Uh, B.R. Mani was very close to S.P. Gupta. S.P. Gupta and B.B. Lal are the father of Hindutva archaeology in India. So this is something you need to know. There are four figures that is important to be told. B.B. Lal, who excavated the early Ayodhya in 1977, was a very close, he was part of the RSS, he's a Sanghi archaeologist who's still alive. S.P. Gupta who was earlier, I think this needs to be spoken about, S.P. Gupta who was earlier the chief curator of the Allahabad Museum was, uh, of the Allahabad Museum, was unambiguously a Sanghi archaeologist. They both spent a lot of time uh, working on the archaeology, or let's say false archaeology of Ayodhya in 1977, and B.R. Mani, R.S. Bisht, who excavated uh, Dholavira, they were all in the direct lineage of what we call Bhagwa archaeologist. And that's the term that we use. Yeah. In, and uh, Dr. Mani, uh, in the ASI, had become a director, and he was picked up when he was removed with an express purpose of uh, Dr. Mani coming in. And Dr. Mani is trained as a Harpen archaeologist. He's trained as a medieval archaeologist. And this whole act, so this is not an accident mm. that Harappan dancing girl mm. doesn't emerge. Or when she emerges, she emerges in a bikini. a bikini. It's not an accident. It is a calculated practice of destroying museums and institutions in India. And this is not with National Museum. The godfather of National Museum is the Archaeological Survey of India. They have totally taken it up. And this is something that needs to be told, told and yes, spoken about. Absolutely. And so what is happening, and the removal of experts, is that you know why somebody like a Twitter handle like the Indological, the real Indology is coming, is that there's something very interesting happening with the appropriation of past in India, which yeah. has been happening for the last 30 years, yeah. but now it has become virulent. Yeah. 
which emerges from what happened on 6th of December 1992. Yeah. That needs to be underscored. That moment will have, is already having a repercussion and it is going to have yeah. a repercussion. Yeah. Museums like National Museum will be appropriated and might even be destroyed. If you get a chance, online there is a CAG report, CAG, Comptroll yeah. yeah. and yeah. Auditor General of India, 2013. Yeah. It's a 300 page report which has a damning, a damning uh, analysis of Archaeological Survey of India, National Museum. We have close to 100,000 antiquities. They don't have a clue where they are. Yes. Go online, CAG report 2013. This is the government of India telling government of India, you are not going a good job. 2013. Exactly. So this is a longer history. This is a long history. So yeah. should, should, should I take these sorry two? Sorry for taking up. Yeah, can we okay, please, uh, okay, let's take all of them. We have questions okay. at the back. Uh, there's just one thing I... Sorry, sorry. There's just one thing I wanted to mention. You know, there is something basically elitist about museums, you know. And um, unless we can uh, bring the museums outside uh, to, let's say, the schools and, you know, all to uh, the people uh, as such, not confined to the middle classes. I think that is where, otherwise, you see, if unless uh, the common people, slum children, school children, if they think, no, this is something we, like they are interested in cricket, for example. I don't know if that can be done to bring the museum outside. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this. When we take uh, questions at the back, thank there you there so much. If another question on that side, let's take that. Yeah, but that's piche, piche, piche. Mm. I don't know how we are for time. We're not good, no? Uh, Could you start um, your question, Maya? Hi. Yeah. Hello, Kavita. How are you? Um, Okay, so my question basically stems from something that you've been thinking about, thinking about like cultural amnesia and the historical erasure. Uh, and museums perhaps as a peculiar space, a peculiar site for historical narratives written by majoritarian governments. When they are in power, they write a certain narrative. Uh, the National Museum becomes an even more peculiar case because it, it's, it's right after independence. It's when the country is kind of like claiming its heritage, writing its narrative, and everything that is speculative kind of becomes fact. Yeah. When an exhibition like India and the World which is also largely speculative and talks about histories rubbing off on histories and thereby like a collective growth written around the world in nine stories. I want you to kind of respond to the idea of vandalism on two counts. Oh One is vandalism of the exhibition. At the same time, for this vandalism to be performed on a site like the museum, which is also a site of vandalism and displacement and appropriation and borrowed, speculated. Have you ever asked a small and simple question in your life? Mario, every question you ask requires a library. They are all so deep. Sorry. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Janvi, uh, in the front. Yes, and then. OK, Adip, start. OK, I really will be brief. Oh, he was saying something. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Oh, okay. It's working? No. Yeah. Put on the light on. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I don't know. I may take the devil's side in yeah, asking. Yeah. Um, you've reflected on, say, the reconciliation between cultures. And it's been uh, very actively exhibited. My question is regarding the last part of your yeah. presentation. Why? this censorship mm -hmm. on your part yeah. because uh, just as you so responsibly shown the reconciliation part why did you you know not on purpose but uh, you could have all also very responsibly because that is also sort of you yeah. know a, uh, percolation a of yeah. knowledge yeah. and uh, that that also would do service to democracy as an idea so just as simple yeah. as that yeah. 
I will try to be brief. I don't want to be reprimanded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of the classroom. I appreciation, Mario. You have to say, I, I hope you got that part. I did, I did, I did. I absolutely okay. did. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So quickly, I mean, I think we've got enough comments now by now to understand that this is about a claim to past, right? And it's about rewriting the past. And conservation of objects and museums plays a, a certain kind of question problem to this uh, to this situation. Museums are highly contested sites. They've always been contested sites. One other way to think about doing this, because if, I mean, you know, because because this is not simply about understanding what's not happening here, but what do we do elsewhere? And so to think about doing history in other ways, right? So where you engage with the contemporary and do history, where you're not then saying, OK, I, I'm conserving the past, I'm laying a claim to the past. But in fact, you bring history to bear upon doing other things in other forms, right? So you don't have exhibitions in a museum, but you start sort of use, reusing gallery spaces. And you know this is something that I'm trying to do now, like yours, exactly. And that's exactly what you're doing with this hub. So I think looking at other opportunities of public spaces, which can be revitalized, to create the debate, which then can hopefully, as you say, and I, I completely am in agreement with your timeline, which is 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. We've lost so much ground in the last 20 years. It's going to be another 40 years before we can reclaim the ground to say, OK, now back to the museum again, right? And this is, so, so one sentence thing, revitalizing other public spaces to bring history back in, because it is about history. It really is about history and how we reclaim, reclaim our past in order to explain why what's happening now is consequential, right? Yeah. And, and how it kind of, not teleologically, but in terms of, uh, well, how the past, in a sense, bears out in our yeah. current lives. That, was that brief? Uh, no, it was not brief. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I will not get everyone. <laughs> OK, so let me start with the first question first. Uh, regarding the display of the manuscript in our exhibition, uh, when the manuscript was taken off display, we uh, replaced it in the vitrine with a dummy manuscript. We just had two pages printed uh, in color. But there was an iPad nearby that you could scroll through the whole uh, book through, which was uh, quite exciting, I thought. Why is the dancing girl not on show in the National Museum? You know, the dancing girl is not even on show in the permanent gallery of the National Museum, where you have the Harappan Gallery, where you have a case for the dancing girl. There is a replica there as well. As far as I know, the dancing girl has not been on display. And for all we know, the dancing girl no longer exists. You know, It could be. I mean, what, what is the reason? What, what, OK, Avinash seems to know something, no? I mean, it's a possibility. Why do they not uh, show her in their own uh, premises? Which you know brings us to the CAG report that you were mentioning, which paints such a damning picture of the way our institutions have been run. Now, this issue of Bhagwa archaeology, there are two things that are going side by side, which I think are very interesting. So I have a school-going son. And he's studying in a CBSE school, so he gets what you know the centrally gov central government produced textbooks to study. And when I have to try and teach him history, I tear my hair out because the books are bad, of course, but they are so left that to me, as a I think of myself as a liberal, to me the books are annoying because it's only about the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, and I'm like, that is not the whole of the 19th century, you know. I, I find it a problem how um, colored the books are in one color. But parallel to that is the very important move that has been going on over the last 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years that Avinash was pointing to, which is the saffronization of those institutions which are actually um, keeping and producing the sources from which history is written. Now, one of the reasons why we have such poor human resource in our museums and in our archaeological surveys is that it has not been a prestigious profession. It has not been well paid. There is very little autonomy for the people who work on it. It has not been glamorous. And as a result of which, it has not been something that attracts very bright people. And I feel that for very many decades, those who have gone into these institutions have gone because they're ideologically motivated to do so. 
And in fact, Hilal Ahmed has gone further and he has said that it was a conscious uh, process of the RSS to make sure that their people were in these institutions so that in times to come they would have command of them. And I think they successfully did that in the ASI and they have successfully done that in most of our museums in North India. So we know that. So there's this very peculiar thing that there are some elite professors from Jadavpur and JNU who are writing the textbooks that our children are reading. And there are uh, the very uh, strongly right-wing people who are actually the custodians of these institutions that you speak of as public institutions, right? And I think somewhere both these have sort of failed us in some way to produce a broader, more reasoned, um, and less, um, you know, you use the word virulent, so a less virulently ideological interest in history. So those who are interested in history uh, and in the public performance around history are very strongly from the left or very strongly from the right. And there isn't a space in the middle, I think, in public spaces. I have another theory about museums and middle classes, which we can't go into here. But I think historically, public museums in India have actually been spaces for the subaltern classes to visit rather than the middle class. We don't have the French uh, situation over here of embourgeoisment through museum visitorship at all. And that is also one of the uh, things that shapes the museum culture that we have today. Um, Mario, you asked a very large question about vandalism. And it's a question which is actually, it's so large because it's going deep into the epistemological foundations of museum making. You know, where, of course, what we call an institution of preservation is an institution that is feeding off the destruction of monuments so that we can pick up the fragments and bring them into our museums. And therefore, what the museum claims that it does is actually premised on a certain kind of obfuscation and a lie. right? And we do not talk about that lie because it is part of our habitus. It forms us. It's the story we tell ourselves about what we do is contradicted if we accept the reality that you are bringing in. But at the same time, I wouldn't collapse all the levels of vandalism into each other. So the vandalism that is perpetrated by the archaeologist who picks up a piece from the field and instead of trying to stick it back on the temple, brings it into the museum, is a little different from the vandalism that BR Money performs on Naman's exhibition, is a little different from the vandalism that the Islamic State performs in the Mosul Museum. So we will not collapse them. It, it won't help us if we collapse them. But we need to think about all of these acts also as acts that produce meaning even as they destroy object, but objects. But each act is producing a different kind of meaning and a different you know, set of signifiers, right? which we must not um, yeah, congeal. The idea is more about the museum for all these different kinds of animals. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So just, yeah. So just to appreciate the alertness of your question and to say that indeed all these levels of vandalism are premising the museum, are active in the museum, and we must remain um, alert to them and acknowledge them in different ways. Right? Uh, Adip, what you asked, you know, it's my self criticism also. Like I've made fun of something which. I myself performed when I was given the opportunity to mount something in the National Museum. And the thing that I made fun of is the fact that every time we deal with heritage, we only celebrate. It's our default mode. So if I'm looking at Mughal paintings, I'm saying Mughal paintings are great. It doesn't become uh, my place to talk about the economic policies, which might have been bad of the Mughal state or the agrarian policies that may have been bad. If I'm looking at uh, textiles, produced in Bengal, and I'm putting them in a show. I'm saying they are great. Long histories of labor, exploitation that might lie behind them. I don't put that in my show. If I'm looking at some Dhokra work, which is done in Madhya Pradesh or in Bastar, right? I'm celebrating it and the ingenuity of the artisan. Heritage, all, all our heritage discourses tend to be celebratory. Huh? Now, I also got into that mode 
we did have the possibility of bringing in some broken sculptures from Warangal, which is one of the Kakatiya kingdoms, which was um, destroyed by a sultanate incursion. Those objects are there in the corridors of the National Museum. We could have brought it in. We did not think that we could narrativize it well enough in a public forum for it to, you know, for the complexity to come across. So we let it be. It was a kind of dereliction, perhaps you can rightly say, of academic duty on our part. But we stayed with the celebratory mode. You know? And I think there, perhaps, the professional heritage lovers <laughs> have something to learn from, actually, the space of contemporary art, where contemporary art fearlessly brings criticism, brings even self-hatred into its expositions. But in the historical field, we don't do that. We only choose to show something if we can say something celebratory about it. But then we also have to remember that the audience for contemporary art is already an audience of a narrower spread. You know, it's an upper middle class, well-heeled, well-educated audience, which is already converted and understand the complexities of the narrative. In a public museum like the National Museum, we are addressing a very broad range of people. We have to think about how can we put these stories forward, you know, through what means, perhaps through some kinds of indirection as well, in order to be able to do them in a way that is wise. Yeah? Would you like to respond to Janvi? If there's, oh, yeah. sorry, oh, Janvi. Yeah. When you finish everything, Janvi, I have a question. Yeah. Janvi, public space, reclaiming public space. So somewhere, I think I was also addressing her when I was talking about the failure of our textbooks and the failure of the, um, uh, uh, our, you know, our failure to be alert to what is happening to the ASI and the museums. But more and more, I feel, um, and I'm not the right person to feel it with my creaking knees and my slow typing. But more and more, I feel the space to occupy is the social media space. Yeah, we can give up on the museums for the next 10, 20 years, and it actually won't even hurt that much. But let us occupy social media. So many alternative ways to think. Actually, Mike, I have a short question linked to what you're just saying, which is, say, the textbooks, the way it's shifting the population yeah. is taking three, four, five, six years for those kids to grow up and become yeah. the way they want designed to be. But for me, the bigger fear is like the serials that are coming out every evening about Rana Pratap ah, and Akbar yes, and yes, this one and yes, that one. Yes, so yes. what I want to ask you is, say the liberal historians, the educated, creative people, you know, you're constantly transgressing <coughs> boundaries of contemporary and whatever the old style of pre representation and so on and so forth. Why are you not able to devise something to counter on television, on these kind of media, the way you're saying oh. Twitter, which, you know, is a much more quick delivery, kind of, okay, superficial, but I think a new language of speaking, there's no point in hammering on the National Museum and Modi. I think it's the yeah. game of numbers with population at the moment. So we have to approach it in a very different manner. I mean, that was what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's sometimes so difficult because you also feel that people are only willing to hear what they already want to hear. You know, it puzzles me. I read the textbooks that my son is being educated with. And I think that those people who are out there with their sticks and their swords on the street are the people who read these books. So did education do anything to shape minds? Or does it do nothing? Where are people being cultured? Exactly. What is the formation coming from? So even when we breastbeat about the textbooks being changed and the National Museum exhibitions being bowdlerized, maybe they don't count. Maybe what counts is somewhere else. Is there any intellectual autonomy? Sorry, um, you'd have to wait yes, for the saying. mic, no, no, uh, no, no, please, so, so that everybody can. I am asking you to please wait for the mic so that, that everybody oh, can mic. hear you. We're recording. No, no, I just wanted to just add They're recording everything. No, so thank you. Well thank the you audience. so much yeah, for no, waiting. I just wanted yeah. to ask you, is there any intellectual autonomy about the university which exists within the National Museum? Oh. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> I have remained actually autonomous of it. And that's as close. Yeah. No. Uh, actually, I I don't quite know. Yes. Yes. I'm afraid I know very little about that institution, even though it's the other artistry institution in my own city. But I've had practically no interaction with it. So I can't tell you what they teach and what kind of research they encourage. I, I really am ignorant. Let my ignorance speak. Yeah. yeah. We actually have a lot of time for questions in the evening. And it's, in fact, going to be an animated discussion if you all return to some of the participants. Because we have a wonderful second presentation before lunch which I would be very happy to start with. Uh, thank you, Kavita. Thank you. So we're not taking any break. And we'll work a little hard and continue so we can get time for everything else. Our second presenter. Lolly Eshragi is a visiting curator with Freya Carmichael, Lana Lopisi, Tara Hogg, and Sara Bikara Dili at the Institute of Modern Art. We can't. We can't. We actually have to continue. Those who want to leave, please take uh, a space on the side. I need to introduce. Luli is a curator, artist, um, and Monash University PhD candidate visiting Kulin National Lands and Waters. Hails from the Samoan villages of Apia. I'm going to make mistakes with pronunciations. Luli Moega, Siumu, um, Salilo Loga, and other ancestries. His work centers on ceremonial political practices, language renewal, and indigenous futures. And residencies include Sovereign world, Words um, by Oka with Art Space Sydney at the Dhaka Art Summit, Parasite Hong Kong, Banff and Center for Arts and Creativity, uh, and, uni uh, and University of British Columbia. Um, and also, uh, Luli serves on the board of the um, Aboriginal Curatorial Collective in Canada. Um, and we're going to now discuss um, various projects, but also um, ways of, I think, building collectivity um, across terrains. Um, and this, I think, is a very uh, special feature. Also, you can sort of see from the range of places I've sort of mentioned um, of what it means to create um, these sort of solidarities uh, for our generation. Thank you. Can I, can I also test if you can hear yes. yeah. In the meanwhile, we wanted to show you one image. I offer fana afi of malama to the ancestors, elders, plants, birds, animals, lands, waters, and skies of this place where we meet. To Lona, to Lona, to Lona. I come from the villages of Apia, Lelumwenga, Siumu, and Salelolonga in the Samoan archipelago, in the center of the great ocean, the Pars Plateau village of Najafabad, and other ancestries, including Guangdong. 
I'm a grateful visitor to this part of Bengal today and offer warm greetings, especially to my fellow indigenous kin here, including the Santal, Kuruk, Munda, Bumij, Kora, Loda, Ho, Mahali, Bhutia, Sabah, Arbedia, and Tamang peoples, whose territories are included in West Bengal and neighboring Bangladesh. I visited Taka in February to participate in the Sovereign Words program organized by OCA Norway, Artspace Sydney, and the Taka Art Summit, and I'm grateful to visit this place with you all and deepen my understanding of Bengali culture and history across borders. I also thank the Australia Council for the Arts for supporting my presence here. Oh, how do I do this? I am a grateful visitor for the last 10 years in Kulin Nation lands and waters in the southeast of the main island. Living and working near the sacred waterways Meri Yalak and Birrang Yalak and supporting Pule Saoloto, sovereignty, and Soala Pule, deliberative consultation of First Nations peoples in and around the Great Bay Narm in the southeast of the Australian settler colony. I acknowledge the violence of English monolingual presence globally on all, on all our distinct languages and ways of knowing and being, and varied states of language distress here and elsewhere that can only be remedied by more care across communities. <coughs> I'm a multilingual person using ia and u pronouns in Samoan and Persian, and any, English, and any in English, in marking distinct territories of being apart from Western-centered access and consumption. I will situate where I come from, sit, share some reflections on ongoing concerns in my work, and speak to projects centered on Ganganna, language, Saoninga, ceremony, and Onganu Linga display territories. This is a map you might be more familiar with. It's Western uh, cartographic practices, which are completely opposite to how we uh, <coughs> experience territory. And Samoa is. Wait, here. <laughs> We are born of Fanua, land, placenta, of Moana, sea, of Langi, skies, of Niu, coconut, of Talo, root vegetable, of all our gods, of all our Tupunga, ancestors, of all our kin. Basa, Lao, Lao, Lul, Moana Nui Akea, Garigaran, Nata, Moana Nui Akiwa, or the great ocean, encompass vast worlds of atoll and volcanic archipelagos, verdant to arid lands, and fresh to salt waters, ancient and young all connected through Va, relational space, across thousands of years of customary exchange and elements who know no bounds. Thousands of peoples maintain sensual, agricultural, ceremonial, political, and speculative practices in every part of this expansive great ocean and far beyond it through multiple intersecting diasporas. Variously referred to as Oceania, Pacific, Pacific Rim, Australasia, and South Seas, but by the varied interests that led the region's colonial invasion for the last 500 years, as Tongan and Itauke Viti theorist and educator Epeli Hoofa has shown, these worlds can be viewed as a sophisticated oceanscape of relationships rather than tiny islands in a fluid expanse. Ibanaba Itungaru and African American theorist, poet, and educator Teresia Te Aiwa famously explained our kinship links with our primary ancestor in this way We sweat and cry salt water, so we know the ocean is really in our blood. In this series, Samoan, Japanese, and German artist and curator Yuki Kihara, as her persona Salome, wearing the Victorian morning dress, stands in the aftermath of Cyclone Evan and other major climactic and so sociopolitical developments. She questions current generations from a continuous temporal ancestral point across the archipelago about where we have come from, where we are going, and if we are upholding ancestral practices or failing under today's pressures. <coughs> These include the devastating cumulative impacts of extractive mining for guano, gold, copper, nickel, manganese, iron, petroleum, and ancestors' bones on Banaba, Nauru, and elsewhere. The militarized occupation of Hawaii, West Papua, Kanaki, New Caledonia, Australia, Guahan, Bougainville, Tahiti Nui, Okinawa, and nuclear testing to exhaustion on Mororoa, Fangatofa, Bikini, Inuitak, Amchitka, Malden, Kirsmis, Kalama, and across Anangogutha and Nugunu Nations territories in Australia. This was parallel to the kidnapping into slavery of more than 63,000 indigenous peoples from different archipelagos onto the cotton and sugarcane plantations of Queensland and New South Wales from 1863 to 1904. This devastation includes the widespread enslavement and unknown unpaid wages of most First Nations all across the patchwork of Songlands, 
which is misnamed as Australia. In domestic servitude and in sheep shearing stations all across sovereign lands and waters. It also includes the indentured plantation and mining work in slavery containment of peoples from Java, Vietnam, Guangdong, South Asia from Gujarat to Bengal, Madeira, Azores, Okinawa, Korea, Philippines, Algeria, Puerto Rico, Tokelau, Tuvalu, Uvea, and Futuna, Tahiti, and Vanuatu into territories held by France, England, Spain, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Germany. The web of slave trading, commerce in sandalwood, cowrie pine, sugarcane, coffee, vanilla, copper, pearls, sea cucumbers, spices, and minerals continue to unfurl in its complexity and disregard for human and kin suffering or broken ancestral connections continuing to haunt us. Once significant material gains were made through unpaid labor in harrowing conditions, the European colonial fiction of the Anglo-Celtic racially pure colony was re reiterated through laws and policies in Australia and New Zealand and their associated territories in the region. South Asian and Chinese workers were similarly targeted in the first two laws passed by the first settler colonial government of Australia in 1901. South Sea Islanders were deported by Caucasian settler colonists, even to the wrong place of origin, after multiple generations, and many lives were lost in the overseas passages. The families who remained and endured the following century, closely connected to First Nations communities along the eastern seaboard, make up today's 30,000 strong community. In addition to the widespread forced displacement of First Nations across neighboring and distant territories by invading settler colonial governments, there are multiple ways of movement and diaspora of indigenous peoples of further archipelagos and shores of the Great Ocean. Our archipelagos and shores across the Vasa Lao Lao Great Ocean have come under foreign control, nuclear and military testing, plantation and industrial exploitation, and our kin animals, mammals, and birds have found habitats severely reduced or destroyed altogether. We have found the limitless, undulating, sacred relational space that always links us in every direction and across temporal realms to be constrained. Our bodies are reduced to domestic combative employment. Our profound knowledges are reduced to stereotypical tropes of inherent hardworking or lazy ethos or the like all across the region. We are displaced, unable to recognize our territory. All these continuously unfolding colonial situations across the great ocean severely impute the capacity for indigenous languages to be practiced and enriched, valued and empowered in their homelands and in the displaced and diasporic bodies we move within. The first languages of the collection project that I developed in 2016 to 17 at Monash University Museum of Art, continued by Yoda Yoda and Wamba Wamba curator Belinda Briggs, channeled the energy and experience I have in translation and interpreting between indigenous and settler languages in some great ocean archipelagos into a new set of texts for digital and physical display around university buildings and the Mama Museum itself. Artworks by Tiriki Onis, Alec Tipoti, Linda Balba, sorry, Lydia Balbal, Kitty Cantilla, Juan Davila, Judy Watson, and Nikki Carter Peterson held in the collection were the focus of writing commissions by Kimberly Malton, Taji Moore, Cara Kirkwood, Clotilde Bullen, Pedro Wanaimiri, Cam Camilla Marambio, and Fair Carmichael, with translations into Tiwi language by Pedro Wanaimiri, Martu, by Desmond Mitchell Taylor, Chilean Spanish by Camila Marambio, and Cala Lagoya by Alec Tipoti. Whilst being the first such project, to my knowledge, in Australia, the absolute exceptional contribution that this combining of relationships ensured was the territorial acknowledgement sorry, of Kulin Nation sovereignty by Mama. Having worked with Wurundjeri artist, dancer, and knowledge keeper, and Woiwurrung language translator, Mandy Nicholson on Wanumi Le Fao, and uh, as well as other previous projects, she knew me enough to trust this project's artists and communities to more than lip service performing respectability. I see this kind of gesture when part of ongoing working relationships between indigenous and settler communities as generative of more crit critically caring ways of being and knowing. This first languages of the collection project coincided with a crisis for me in, in the inaccessibility and pretense in Western art writing for my communities who are often underrepresented or disregarded as primary stakeholders. So I decided to stop using words that came out of my mouth with great difficulty, not because they were hard to pronounce or understand, but because the distanciation between speaker, speech, and audience was counter to va, or relational space, understandings of how the world is ordered and kinships maintained. Practically, this means that I strive to write more poetically, more honestly, whether writing about artists, exhibitions, performances, structural racism, and heritage patriarchy, and indigenous resurgence into the future.
Having worked with South Sudanese artist Atong Atem for the project Wanumi Lefau at Gertrude Contemporary in Inner Biraranga or Melbourne as part of the Next Wave Festival in 2016, I wrote about three new video works she had shot in Viti or Fiji for the, video vi sorry, for the channel's video art festival last year. What I really want to emphasize is the specificity of her and my relationship to Viti, as Fiji is a second home to her and is a neighboring civilization to Samoa to me, and our kinship as diasporic indigenous peoples visiting and growing up in Kulin Nation territory. I'll never get the hang of this. Through this writing expressed by email and in person over large distances when she and I were in residence away from, artist residencies away from Biranga, we are able to make a textual relational space that is not bound by the anti-blackness of carceral police and mediatic violence that right now upholds white supremacist rule in the Australian settler colony and targets South Sudanese peoples as gangs. I will now talk about indigenous conceptions of Sauninga, ceremony, and Ngafa, genealogical time, before highlighting an ongoing concern as an artist making performative gestures and as a curator working to date on activating performance works by fellow indigenous artists from North America and the Great Ocean, and in the near future with indigenous artists of East and South Asia. I'm also going to hand around some copies of a recent project that Atong was in, and also uh, Yuki. Our ceremonies are markers of political, spiritual, and sensual practices that predate and will outlive colonial incursions and impacts in the Great Ocean. My life and what I can do is only possible because I am enabled in relationship to ceremonial political structures of local and diasporic indigenous peoples. I am bound by ancestral teachings in the glaring lack of cession of monumental violences by the Australian settler colony against First Nations territories, peoples, and knowledges to my role as a grateful and uninvited visitor from across the near seas, a relative adjacent to these experiences. By ceremonial political structures, I mean the kinship-based indigenous knowledge systems that link all of existence in mutually beneficial relationships across deep time and space, in which are learnt, expanded, and embodied through visual, performing, and oratory forms that are in turn bound by and directed to the ancestors. My tina matua, grandma, mano na tia pilia'e fa'ase'e, has been an artist her whole life, independent of the gallery system, supporting our expansive family relationships across volcanic soils, salt waters, damp airs, in a sovereignty that is care from the land, in a matriarchy that is love from the ancestors, in a binding of diasporic children that is, the, that is making with the fruit of your labor what is denied us in the capitalist system of our colonizers, who never leave our minds, spirits, bodies, our societies, politics, economies. The keys to our liberation are also found in the wisdom of the diaspora for all our people. Tina Matua reiterates her messages to me and my cousins in Samoan and in English. I draw on her and other family members' daily artistic practice who produce miasina, fine handwork, handmade works, from fala, pandanus, fau, hibiscus, and ua, paper mulberry bark. Lalanga, the weaving of elements from fonua, land, vai, water, langi, sky, with specific narration of histories, forms, ancestral figurines, or scary dolls, depending on your <laughs> perception, baskets, clothing, homewares, and utensils. Our handmade goods, our understanding of our bodies in long lines of ancestry, our orated and tattooed literature, bring us closer to indigenous futures, to great ocean futures. Kanaka Oivi writer and language activist Brian Kamali Kuwada asserts that we need to again normalize indigenous languages in order to, gen in order to continuously generate indigenous worlds, speaking specifically of renormalizing Olelo Hawaii language to have a Hawaiian world. We've always lived in the future because genealogical time contains indigenous future-focused ways of being. From my experience living in Yui, Banjalang, Yugumbe, Turbal, Yagara, and Kulin territories, as well as my own clan's territories, locating ourselves in ever-expanding ways of knowing and being is vital. Vital to any sustainable negotiation by indigenous peoples on and off ancestral territories, in Euro-American dominated settler colonial co institutions and aesthetic political spaces and into sovereign futures. Is to become water or sensual to become versed in indigenous practices of stewardship and kinship with lands and waters once more? How is this shift at all possible under continuing colonial capitalist flows? 
Water is our primary ancestor in the great ocean, which is, a remind you, a third of the Earth's surface, impacting all life on this planet, yet underrepresented or erased from voicing perspectives in the majority of human-centric discourses and practices evolving out of an unenlightened, empire-hungry Europe. We are fluid beings, physically and philosophically, such that states of being in various indigenous languages relate us to water. A number of ceremonial political practices in Samoan, Kanaka Oivi, and Haku cultures that I am familiar with center on the purifying use of fresh water, water with grated turmeric, water with salt, and coconut water to assemble ancestral beings in each context. My latest performative gesture, Paper Skin, targets the South Australian Museum, located in Ghana Nation Territory, or Adelaide, which vaunts its highly distressing and culturally incompetent display of ancestral remains and belongings in 19th century styled wood and glass curios cabinets in its Pacific Gallery. Resistant to more than two years of our community's emails and social media posts calling for the gallery to close and critical care to be administered to the ancestral remains and belongings held within, the South Australian Museum's curators keep empty assurances flowing, even last week. The hurt and anguish over this racist display practice doesn't dissipate for indigenous peoples from the Great Ocean's archipelagos. I can't write any more emails or essays about this dehumanization. I need to grieve and mourn in a shared ceremonial political structure that is sovereign to the extractive consumptive gaze of Caucasian institutions, which denies, uh, in turn, our agency and responsibility to our continuing practices and presences. In July 2018, in the same week as NADOC celebrations of black matriarchy across Australia, the museum announced a glass cube was to be placed in the Pacific Cultures Gallery with Caucasian dancers taking the surrounding curios as inspiration. White supremacist dehumanization of our ancestors, our agency, and our own performing artists knows no bounds. Haku, curator, engineer, and knowledge keeper, Auntie Sana Balai, mentored me and many others in indigenous communities on the southwestern shores of the Great Ocean, including in the use of water for purification and the intentionality of introductions to ancestral remains and belongings when entering and departing from museum and archive collection stores. My performative gestures need to be contextualized in a geographic and generational dispersal of Samoan Talafa Asalopito, sequential histories, and Onganu Ofa'alinga, display territories, that is not taught in any Euro-American Euro derived place of learning. I call on the radical indigenous resurgence, particularly queer indigenous lifeways, driven by Samoan artists, poets, and curators Yuki Kihara, Rosanna Raymond, Angela Tiatia, Lana Lopesi, Dan Talapapa McMullen, Pati Solomona Tyrell, Tanungango, and many others in bringing our tongues to speak, moving our hips and hands to touch, and to become well, become sovereign in heterogeneous brilliance. So I'm crying over images of the gallery from the website and pulling my hair out. This body of work by Sanchintia Mohini Simpson addresses the unacknowledged history of South Asian women taken to South Africa and elsewhere as indentured labor during the late 1800s to early 1900s. Subverting the race hierarchy embedded in the Rajput miniature painting genre in North India, Sanchintia depicts the mistreatment of these women on the sugarcane plantations they were sent to, indicting years of shame, intergenerational trauma, and cultural loss that heavily impact South Asian indentured diaspora communities today. Sanchintia's recent exhibition at Black Dot Gallery in Biraranga was a significant moment for South Asian diasporic artists, the most recent of many who are at home in this global indigenous contemporary art gallery. Poet Manisha Anjali and artist curator Shivanjani Lal are witnesses to their, indi indi sorry, to their Indian Fijian histories and further diaspora into Australia, marking indentured connections as well as their experiences as peoples of the great ocean as well. Whilst indigenous artists and curators are regularly featured in exhibitions, publications, and programming aimed at specific publics, indigenous sovereignty over financial and political means is usually lacking, and context is nowhere to be seen. I would call this an experienced invisibility, where the majority of audiences, arts education spaces, media and public and private institutions in Australia do not see the work in the same light as community members who experience works, their nuances, and their politics more fully, because embracing from within. In turn, almost all major indigenous exhibitions in Australia are framed as introductions to indigenous aesthetics and the beginning of a reparation to, of settler and indigenous race relations. 
but never include the exposition of facts and culpability for the purposes of indigenous determined justice and healing. Heterogeneous indigenous practices and worlds are typically underrepresented or flattened in misunderstanding and stereotyping in Australian galleries, museums, forums, and media. Yet community-centered spaces such as Black Dog Gallery here have never lost their edge. Their openness to experimentation, high standard work, community-driven critique, and yarning circles around the fire pit to round off a day or night of performances, readings, or viewings. Black Dot Gallery, as an, ongan, as an Onganu'u of Fa'alinga indigenous display territory, is not solely a gallery, but our living room cultural center. And it's like 10 minutes from my house, <laughs> next to the gym. <laughs> indigenous display territory, not solely a gallery, but our living room cultural center, where local Kulin Nation cultural expression is naturally in relationship with, south, uh, with surrounding Southeastern First Nations cultural expression and diasporic, South Asian, indigenous, and non-European practice, practices from all around the world. Where cups of tea, food, family, and discussion are all normal and core to the way the space runs. The mediocrity and whiteness of most artist-run spaces. Dang. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> Speaking very fast. The mediocrity and whiteness of most artist-run spaces contemporary galleries and public and private art museums, in Australia at least, belies the importance of spaces such as Black Dog Gallery in Kulin Nation territory for the city, and Bush Gallery here in Tsukhwapmukh Nation territory, far in uh, Western Canada, far from urban environments amongst others. When it is so clear that mainstream Eurocentric spaces service a select group in the Caucasian diaspora, we can expect that our indigenous art institutions be funded and supported at similar levels at least, and beyond, if we are serious about reparations and addressing the specter of indigenous determined visual, performing, and literary presence, unmitigated by the conceit of white fragility and denialist conduct. For me, Black Dot is the most organically co collective space that I have been part of. Built through the wise leadership of Rajri curator and filmmaker Kimba Thompson, long involved in her community's Aboriginal exhibitions and advocacy in the Narm region, including co-curating the first Indigenous art exhibition at the National Gallery, of Victoria, uh, National Gallery of Victoria, the largest art museum in the country, with artist and curator Marie Clark. This is our living archive. It is where I have first viewed critique, sorry, first received critique on culturally resonant terms from elders, peers, and mentors, and continue to view and understand exceptional Indigenous artistic and curatorial practice. Yoda Yoda curator and writer Kimberly Moulton counterbalances the tensions of indigenous display histories in relation to the oppressive, omnipresent Euro-American art history called capitalized. Capitalized, capitalist, capped for others, not us, in poetic terms. And you can wait while I have a drink. <laughs> when thinking about the state of the nation, and the state of museums and galleries within it, is sovereign assertion through art and culture only possible when we reject the Western canon of art history? There is strength in challenging the status quo, rejecting the pattern that our art, bodies, and culture are only noticed when recognized by the white center. We do not need this. Our first people's ways of being and understanding surpass this, and we do not need to be defined within this canon as, if we, as we can never fit within something that is constructed from our exclusion. The visible and invisible, wait, that's another one. The visible and invisible borders of European derived hegemony do not represent our indigenous geographies, tied as they are in genealogical matter and deep listening to all living things. The collective marking of moments in service to the ancestors was forcibly shifted to linear time. The collectively realized relationships or alliances between all things was attacked by animate and inanimate space. The earth-centered philosophies of being were degraded by fierce individualism and capital-seeking greed, flowing directly from the ironically named in Enlightenment period's empire building. Only Samoan cultural practices and history can offer the viewer the fuller, under re sorry, the fuller resonances of this work by Angela Titia, signaling a return to ancestral fanua, land, placenta, to sovereign indigenous being outside of European thought activated precisely because Tia Tia, outside the frame, wears the sacred Malu tattoo, at once so sociopolitical protection, genealogical proof, and spiritual imprint. Samoan writer and educator Mawa, Mawalai Val Albert uh, Wendt 
reminds us, our words for blood are toto, ele, ele, and palapala. Toto can also mean to plant. Ele, ele, and palapala are also our terms for earth, soil, or mud. We are therefore made of earth or soil. Our blood, which keeps us alive, is earth. So when you are tattooing the body, the self, you are reconnecting it to the earth, reaffirming that you are earth, <coughs> genetically and genealogically. This project last year, Paul Yuli, comprised activations of both Faitautusi, or archive, a library, contentious, <laughs> and Fa'alinga, exhibition or display, of countless documents pertaining to indigenous genders, sexualities, ceremonial political structures, knowledges, ecologies, as well as catalogues, monographs, video, and photographic works. The Faitautusi element is key to anchoring viewers in, in indigenous aesthetic and intellectual histories in spaces where indigenous experiences and knowledges hold pride of place, at least temporarily. These are spaces of responsibility on the viewer or reader to engage in order to center indigenous ways of knowing and being. Angela's work offers a tethered indigenous Samoan space in a medium echoing bark cloth artistic expression from which to host activations, access to knowledges, and relationships of learning, reciprocity, and respect. The wallpaper's work Sorry, the wallpaper works presence at the center of the long gallery at West Space in Bidaranga, Melbourne, and in the Ala Moana Center in Honolulu last year, act as a, uh, sorry, the, its present is, presence is a deliberative, <coughs> deliberate amplification, a rarefied occurrence of power and presence from an otherwise small framed print. <coughs> Significantly, the archive reading space was packed up, and both spaces went back to their usual Euro American mainstay of programming. The Onganu'u of Fa'alinga described here, indigenous display territories, are grounded in indigenous histories spanning the great ocean, are activated by diverse communities in relation to dominant Euro-American histories and practices, but not subsumed by them. We are part of indigenous resistance, meaning centering indigenous languages, bodies, and spaces in the continuing Eurocentric art sector and political sector more broadly, whilst not reducing our presence stereotypes or accepted difference as defined by European desires. I look forward to learning more from each of you about where you come from and where you're going. Aima Sarhao, Don Nobad, Malianganga Faafitai Ya Oto Uma Ilene Fono, Maonga Nu SS Ililalangi. And I just have uh, one thing. I respectfully request questions from queer and trans people in the room first and cis men later. <laughs> First. From? Queer and trans Queer. people. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 you're getting two mics, Shana. Yeah, start. No, no, you're, well, this is, well, first is first you. Two, first I mean, uh, when we okay. get to public, then we can you can go. It's fine. You can start. I'm, I'm good with it, really. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I think the act of translation is very important in, in building bridges, building empathies um, across the globe. Uh, and translation not only of language, but also context, belief, and ways of seeing. Uh, but there is an inherent and often unacknowledged labor in this work of translation. Um, so what are strategies that you have seen, that you have experienced, that you have formulated in uh, finding energy for this constant translation <coughs> when our uh, energies are systematically depleted by settler capitalism? Um, thank you. Can we go onto the internet? I'll bring up an article. On indigenous <laughs> emotional labor. <laughs> Type in indigenous emotional labor and Anne Riley. <laughs> <laughs> emotional <laughs> labor. Emotional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and then Anne with an E and then Riley. Anne Riley? Yeah. Please. It's this first. Iladze, pulse in the wrist. So um, I'm currently exhausted, not because of being here and experiencing 
the wealth of all the knowledge and sharing and debates, which is not common in Australia. So I'm very appreciative of being here. Um, but because I'm the only indigenous person doing a PhD in my university, and many times I've had like meltdowns and crises and wanted to leave and just go home. Um, so I think pairing back what you do is like the yeah, a lot less. And that actually, um, when getting invited to things or things coming up, uh, something that a friend of mine constantly reminds me is like, does that serve our purposes? Or are we serving the institution or broader debates purposes and just being utilized? So I don't know if that's much of a response. But thank you. Thank you. Um, just to interject, because I think this question of translation, of course, I mean, this was a, a fantastic answer. Um, but just there's also the kind of technicality mm. um, to come to that because your um, exercises in writing and of of um, the kind of worlds of of language really, um, and then within that having this more sort of um, this network of 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 colleagues and of of very different sort of modes of sort of actually shifting the the terrains of identification as well is also that process of uh, translation that yeah. you take up uh, in performance, um, in among land and water, as you said, um, but also uh, basically in text uh, yeah. as much. So if you could. Yeah, I, maybe um, in, in the paper skin work, I don't speak at all. Mm -hmm. I just cry. That's the only language that is appropriate to that kind of dehumanization, that they're like rancid racism. Um, and it's not an isolated situation. You know, there's ancestors probably from here that were dug up and are in the British Museum and many other places. And they have this weird ownership of ancestors' bonds. Um, but in other performance work that I do, I'm constantly shifting from languages. And uh, I'm finishing my PhD. And uh, one of the readers was like, oh, you don't, you don't uh, give a meaning for each of the terms in all these languages the first time we see them. I was like, go to the glossary at the end. Like, do some work. Like, it's not going to be on a platter, you know. Like, and I think the Google Translate is really dangerous in the way that um, it has Samoan on there, and it's highly incorrect. Mm. But it also means that if you're looking for a basic term, then Samoan language is part of this Western Unicode future. Um, but all of our dictionaries were written by missionaries, so. Wind, or like a malama that I uh, offered at the beginning is a morning and evening prayer um, to the ancestors and the gods of a place. And the U missionaries translate that as window. Yeah. as a deliberate obfuscation of who we are and the lineage that we have that's thousands of years old to be like subservient into kind of um, accessing who we might be through an English prism or German prism. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. much can't hear you. Uh, page number 10, uh, 19 yeah. says that gay, straight, we are beyond all of that. Uh, this is only, this is important for me, this is only because it is you. I just like to reflect uh, on this and mm, particularly in, you know, in the context of the indigenous uh, culture because here uh, in India um, the idea of the you know quote unquote the queer or the gay it's sort of you know it's it's sort of uh, it is there it is interwoven in such a way that it is not claimed as an identitarian uh, so I just like to know your idea and sort of why uh, how have you uh, put it put this in and, and what have been the reflections? Thank you. Um, so that catalog that's going around, Wanumi Le Fa, was a project I curated uh, in 2016 in Gertrude Contemporary, which is a contemporary art space that has rarely had indigenous curators and artists exhibit within it. And um, it, for 30 years, was located in a 
neighborhood that was really significant to Aboriginal civil rights and queer organizing and activism, union activism in Melbourne, which is completely erased because it's like 100% gentrified now. So that project was really, like there was many site-specific exhibitions that had happened in the institution before that talked about labor and not, never talked and touched on the Aboriginal community-run organizations that were started all around it. For the, and that are like the health service, the legal service, all these kinds of infrastructure. Um, and there's a lot of bars that are queer spaces. There's a lot of community organizing health services that are also nearby. And I was trying to bring those together. But at the same time, like even terms like queer is like shorthand from an a intellectual tradition that is not from my body, in a sense. I have some European ancestors too. <laughs> but the, you know, if I were to introduce myself in a Samoan way, there's no language like queer. It's not even gay or trans. It's fatama, fafafine, and other ways of being that change throughout the day. Um, so, but I think what you're maybe saying is like that uh, sexuality-based identification in the public sphere comes after your like cultural or religious um, identification, and I think that's definitely the case for me and my community sometimes. Hi, um, I think just maybe going back to language a bit, but not necessarily. Um, there's a certain very patronizing tone that is adopted in, the, in conversations around indigenous communities and in conversations around indigenous history. And I think you know that also operates around caste in India. And the patronizing tone, okay, I really want to. Um, and, the, and this kind of patronization manifests primarily in the very didactic tone that is adopted in the telling of histories that are actually entirely ambiguous. And they're ambiguous because you know, there aren't like finite objects from which to draw these histories because it's all in the telling of like, I don't know, travel through song and you know, um, painting, but m mostly they travel through like a very domestic, familial telling of history. So the history that we learn from our grandparents, essentially. So I'm, I'm trying to think about maybe, I, I, or maybe I'm trying to ask you to talk about what it means to give a, the, this kind of ambiguity of formalism, which is what's like demanded, I think, within the museum or exhibition space, and what happens when that formalism also is, an, is a type of aestheticization. There were some conversations yesterday around queerness or queer utopias being aesthetic utopias, which was also, I think, confusing to me. And perhaps you could speak towards that as well. Thank you. Um, I think what I'm gathering is like, I have a, maybe I'll come. I, so I have only been to this part of the world twice before, to Dhaka, and then five years ago as a tourist um, around India. And I definitely have no understanding of Adivasi experiences to speak to them. But I did meet and spend time with Santal, Tripura, Chakma, people, Garo people in Taka. So, and a lot of the artists and filmmakers there from those communities live in Australia. So they're like same in the diaspora like me. So that kind of shifted things again. Um, I'm maybe a bit like, uh, keep coming with like word separatist, but I don't think that's the right word. But like I would like make an next I would like come to artists with a proposal of like a completely village kind of like structure in a white cube gallery, and a lot of these artists who are friends of mine and mentors and peers want to be in a white wall space without that kind of um, intervention into exhibition formalism. So <coughs> it's like a it's like a um, relationship I think that of like which project might work, but they're like different things that we've worked on together over the different years, especially in the Biranga Melbourne context of things that um, are maybe operating on a register that's not for public consumption. So after the opening ceremony from an elder, we'll place um, uh, eucalyptus leaves in the corners of the gallery. And that's never explained to the majority white audience in Melbourne. But uh, when people from the local communities come in, who are probably already engaged in art, and you know, it's not necessarily completely shifting their audience development because I wasn't paid enough to do that. Um, mm. They will know that that the, that ceremony has happened there. 
So there's like, I, one of my supervisors at the time was like, this isn't enough of a change from formalism, what are you doing? Uh, the one Miller Lefau pr project specifically. And I was like, oh, you, there's things that you just, you don't know, that's not for you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that at all answers. Um, just a second, there's already a few questions. Let's take Sabi's and Wait, then Rosalind. I should have written it <laughs> Okay. According to his dictate, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, sir. Okay, let's do that. And then Mario. I'm merely respecting what he said. <laughs> no, I asked you. I said, I put it in a question tag kind of way. It seemed rhetorical, but you still had the agency to answer. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask you a question about a term that I only recently came across because I'm always late to the party. Um, I was listening to this, this uh, podcast by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, it's called The Lady Vanishes. And uh, he speaks about this... Um, English artist Elizabeth Thompson and this famous painting that she did called Roll Call, which was, you know, it created a bidding war and was finally bought and acquired and it's a long story. But I was interested because he uses this term moral exclusionism, um, which I thought was a very interesting, uh, sorry, moral licensing. That's the term. And it's about how um, uh, people feel that if they've done enough good deeds as such, it gives them license to do something bad. This is how in a diet you explain cheat days. Um, but he talks about how this works and operates in larger ways when it comes to representation. And in the case of Elizabeth Thompson, her work was hung in the Royal Academy, you know, that one work. And then never again was she shown. Yeah. She never got into the, and she vanished. And even when her husband wrote a biography, she was not part of it. And this uh, pod podcast is also interesting because it speaks to the Australian Prime Minister, the first uh, woman, and uh, in the speech she gave in Parliament where she attacks Tony Abbott and talks about, I will not take lessons from, of, uh, from about misogyny from you. Um, I'm interested in how this kind of plays out in terms of um, indigenous art and expression. I also speak to you as, you know, as someone who's queer, as someone who's a woman, because I see how I am constantly excluded from things because I'm late to the party, because someone else has come before me and has taken my place. And it's this whole notion of the seat at the table, you know, which is the title of Solange's <laughs> beautiful album. Uh, but it is this notion of seat at the table. And as much as we can try to say that we reject the West, yeah. canon, um, we still do look for, uh, we're actually looking to be visible. It's yeah. not even about the Western canon, it's about being visible because in visibility and in being seen, that's how we get rehumanized in a yeah. certain way and it's about a process of rehumanizing, you know, especially cultures that have been dehumanized. And how do you look at your own position in terms of the space that you then claim? And do you fear that it that your claiming of that space might have repercussions on somebody else not being? Or is your purpose to enlarge the space? Yeah. Thank you so much. That's great. Uh, but just could we take a sure. few more responses and questions? Um, also from the back. Before, sorry, Sabi, you kind of now in queue because there's. Uh, <laughs> Vidisha and and then Sabi. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, um, hi. Um, I think I was just actually. It's not really a question, but it's just something that happens, which I see that a lot of institutional critique practice. I mean, institutional as critique as an arts practice is being performed within a curatorial space and not within the artist space. And that's what you kind of see with that performance of, you know, crying over the pictures of the gallery or also looking at other systems of arts practice and where we are making art. And um, I mean, so I think there were se several questions, not just here, but otherwise as well, that who is the new curator? And that's the, I think these are the reasons with which why what's also happening is that slowly that the space of the arts, which is the elitist upper class upper caste space of the arts, is getting queered, and queered not in the sense of that people who are 
sort of who also a lot of first generations which are coming from other castes who have started to participate in it so it kind of becomes queered uh, but and and institutional critique gets performed and it needs to be performed this way so i mean i'm just talking about this sort of a shift which is happening within curatorial practice which is emerging in the 2010s in south asia is happening through the younger artist as curator and curator as an institutional critique. Mm -hmm. so Can I just answer these two first mm -hmm. briefly, because I'll get yeah. everywhere. Um, the first time that I did that performance, uh, I'd rather to call it a gesture, it's not a performance, um, was at the launch of Un Magazine 12.1, uh, which is edited by indigenous editors for the first time, and is called The Unbearable Hotness of Decolonization with incredible articles <laughs> from all around the world. Everything's online, unprojects.org.au, you can access. Um, and so I knew that I would have my own community in the room. People from the islands and people from Australia, from First Nations there. So it's like a home crowd, and I would not do it in a space that is like majority white. And the next time I do it will be in Sanchintia's exhibition in a month in Brisbane. So it's again in a very specific space um, I would love to be able to picket the museum and do it at the front and do a hunger strike or something, but I can't, I'll fall apart. I'm already falling apart. So it would, it's just too much. Um, but, you know, there's a bit of social media, media battles and things like that. The other thing I was going to say is like, I've, in my PhD, I've tried to define a Samoan conception of display histories and practices that is not Western curatorial practice, but can, you know, you can, we can use these words as if they're the same, but they're not. Because we don't have, like in Samoan cultural practice, this morning I'm speaking, tomorrow, like in five minutes I'm making you a cup of tea and then we walk down the road and it's, it's the roles shift so f swiftly. So um, the, the authority of these positions is completely um, shifting. Someone leadership is based on suffering until you get there. Everyone else trotting on you until you get there. So it's a very, it's, that's at least <laughs> something. Um, and also coming to Solange. Um, sorry, I, can't, I forgot the other bit. Yeah, I would like moral licensing. Yeah, I think I was thinking particularly about the exhibition Indigenous Australia, curated by Francesca Cabillo, which is in Delhi. Um, and how it strikes me as an opportunity for First Nations artists and curators from Australia to uh, dialogue with people from Adivasi communities and use this like visitation from overseas to highlight local situations in the same way that uh, Indigenous art from India is displayed in the Asia Pacific Triennial in relationship to Indigenous practices there, but also I'm not an Aboriginal person from Australia, so I can't really speak on that. But I will say that it's particularly the hyper-representation of Indigenous practice from Australia, within Australia and overseas, is not accompanied by people. So the entire Aboriginal art world in Australia is run by white people, except for like five curators. You know, it's very, um, the, the stakes haven't changed in 30 years. So that's kind of what Kimberly and others are trying to critique. and are rising up into positions of influence, but it's when you actually have control of the budget, right? Um, sorry. Okay, uh, very quickly, because I know we're past time. Um, Hello, okay. So, um, like, I think it goes without saying that almost any group, any community, any place also has internal violence built into it, and therefore, there's a lot of sometimes striving among several, and that internal violence can be on the basis of gender, all sorts of normativities based on which various groups are sort of marginalized within. And um, therefore, um, there's also this kind of a, oftentimes a striving for actually either rewriting this, the indigenous narrative or the tradition, or sometimes repudiating it entirely yeah. because that is the tradition you've that has oppressed you for the longest time. And so how does one sort of deal with this um, double sort of uh, bind where 
on the one hand, of course, there is a larger history of oppression that you're referring to because of colonization and all these, and also an equally large, sometimes uh, even a longer sort of uh, perpetuation of internal violence within that. And how does that register then in terms of a kind of self-representation? How does one either reinscribe or repudiate? Where's the space for that? And um, can Could I we add? take, uh, sure, okay. Maybe in answering this, I if it works for you, you can speak a little bit about the, you can speak about um, your upcoming work with technology and VR. Yeah. And one more uh, question from the back, Mario. And then, yeah. Okay, Nandita, um, is there a mic at the back? Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm my name is Manush. Uh, I have a question to you that uh, about, the, about the community. Uh, when you are working in your community, uh, uh, and in your bio, I saw that uh, you called ceremonial politics. And uh, when you were dealing with the Aboriginal or the indigenous uh, art practices, how you um, how you uh, its ceremonial uh, practices in a different space or in that community? Are you uh, inviting people to the community? It's kind of a community-led initiative. Or, you know. Could we take the other question from Nandita? <coughs> That's fine, you can start and then. Uh, okay, firstly, thank you for that presentation. Uh, my question is on two counts and slightly long, sorry. Uh, I want to firstly begin with the idea of Asia altogether and between two counts, first is obviously the impossibility of imagining Asia and the second, the second count of the problematics of imagining in Asia. Uh, within this, I think the struggle lies in two counts. The first count being the Euro Northern segregation and slotting of Asia, say, for example, Australia, um, Asia, and Pacific, and the Levant, etc. And on the other count is the systematic erasure and the change of language in the national narrative, which is to say when the nation state kind of erases, uh, say, for example, in Gujarat, for <laughs> example, the Adivasi is now systematically replaced by the term Vanvasi, which means that from the original inheritors of the land, or the inheritors of the land since time, you're replaced as somebody who occupies the forest. Within these two frameworks, um, where do we place, since you talk about language, like how can we probably curatorially think of a language of decolonizing that is already kind of struggling with this first count of this Euro-American narrative, and then you have a second demon already over there in the form of the nation state, and also then the problems of inclusion, which also is like a demon because it then leads to tokenism and then leads to representation and thereby and thereof. Uh, perhaps I'd like you to respond to that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll just answer these and then we come to you. Um, I'm not talking about inclusion. I'm not talking about diversity, key performance indicators. And the I'm specifically talking about these spaces that are indigenous owned and run because they are for us, by us. So I don't know necessarily how to approach the Gujarat situation, the context rather, but um, a lot of theoretical propositions happening in this indigenous art discourse globally are around um, finding ways of relating from our languages, which is why I really, um, base everything on what I'm saying from our languages because sometimes it's a term, there's an inflection on a term that hasn't been used in 500 years that can set us free or something, you know, like it can take us on a whole other path. Um, and I'm not from Australia it, like in terms of ethnically, I'm from the islands nearby, so it's like this uh, triple community thing where I'm like part of the local community also part of the diaspora community and I'm part of this community back home. Um, 
where the censorship from the state is so, and the church is so virulent that nothing like this can happen. Because you can barely show your body without clothing, you know? Even though we didn't have clothing in 1830. You know, more than loincloth or whatever, you know? Um, so, I don't know if that at all goes to. I think what's striking for me on one level since I've been here is the constant reference to French theorists in English yes. translation, which I was yes. shocked <laughs> that is exactly like the art schools in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and the US. And barely anyone can read the French, right? I can read the French, but I'm tired of that too, because Derrida was brown, Sixou was brown, Toussaint Louverture was black, but they all get bleached in French history. <laughs> and so there's, so there's a, yeah, yeah, and so there's a, you know, like, and I don't know at all enough South Asian art histories to even be here, and it's an absolute honor and privilege, but I don't know anyone besides Tagore, and I need to do my reading, but it's also the, um, the bind of, like, you know, Walter Mignolo talking about decoloniality, I don't believe and Jolene Rickard and other indigenous theorists and leaders are telling us that we can't find our solutions to the master's tools, sorry, you can't, de like, you can't decolonize from European knowledges. That's the whole problem. Europeans have forgotten their own indigeneities and their responsibilities to their valleys and plains and coasts and their ancestors. So that's not gonna help us necessarily. If we need to work out how to save this planet before it destroys us, because she's upset. You know, and we're not listening. We haven't been listening for hundreds of years. I don't. Um, it's I really about the language and the ceremony. Like ceremony is political. Ceremony is resistance. It is indigenous sovereignty or South Asian sovereignty or non-European sovereignty. But Europe has its indigenous peoples too, Sami and others. And it's not. It's it's always you know. It's not just like anti-white, but it's from the Australian position that I was trying to say. You know, these kind of specific um, things. We have a um, last question. Um, uh, uh, Jilo, did you want to say I can, something about? I can, but I feel like yeah. Um, last okay. comment, and then I'll respond to both. Okay. Do you, do you want to finish? No, you're good. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is um, um, maintaining a space of queerness uh, is a lot of work. Um, and and uh, of course we are talking about queerness in in in, in the widest <coughs> possible sense that uh, we can push against. Um, how in doing this work do you avoid or work through the pitfalls of internal structures, of desires for power, for definitions, for um, clarity? Um, that exist within our communities, within our queer communities, within a subaltern community. Um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, if you could share some of yeah. the strategies you use for that. Aunties. There's um, something that's been happening at Black Dot a few times where queer indigenous and POC elders and younger generation get to spend time together. And it's like super emotional and incredible, but uh, you can find your family outside of your family, right? Mm -hmm. The chosen family and this kind of um, support and critique. I think Auntie Sana Balai and other elders are the people who keep me in check mm -hmm. and they're my rocks, or rock, whatever. So, but um, I don't know necessarily how to respond around. I'm quite like burnt by the queer community in Australia right now, and I'm really done with that kind of structural mm -hmm. racism and this consumption and exotification of brown and black bodies. Um, 
heavily influenced by your American public culture and <coughs> modes of organizing and practicing as well. So I think I'm somewhere between like some idealization of who we were before colonization in the islands and this like messed up present where I'm not happy with the structures that happen, but those kind of meetings with elders put it all into perspective because we're not being rounded up and put into jail bars right now, mm -hmm. in, or in some places, right? But my mom works running a mental health organization in Samoa, and the high, and I'm gonna be like a bit defeatist, but the highest suicide attempts every weekend are under 15. And I absolutely believe that they are, and that's the same in the diaspora as in the homeland, that it's based around the spirit, and sex, and gender and this like forced binary of who we might be now according to the system that doesn't work because the bodies and the minds and the spirit are completely fluid. So that's something that kind of, you know, I might be going and traveling and doing all these things and other peers too, but it's like, how is anything I'm doing helping the human experience? I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's a good question to keep asking. And then um, I just wanted to, I refute that we have internalized violence practice, violent practices and histories, at least in where I'm from. Samoa as a, like eight kingdoms, was colonized for five to 600 years by Tonga nearby, and we still resent them for everything. But they also like not making it so much in our world, so yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, they're great, but um, a Bunwurang elder and historian, Bruce Pascoe, um, Uncle Bruce Pascoe has put out a book years ago and it's like constantly getting reprinted and sold and it's going all over the place and Bangara Dance Theatre just made a theatre production, a dance theatre production around it, it's called Dark Emu. So and his, he draws on all of these colonial texts and also indigenous oral histories from different communities across the continent, that's another loaded thing, um, and is basically saying that 60 plus thousand years of peace and cohabitation and sharing and trade existed by between First Nations across Australia and their neighboring peoples. And that's evidenced by them being the first stone villages 30,000 years ago, uh, bread practices, fiber practices, all these kinds of things that are, have moved, uh, kind of continued into the present. So I think at least for that context, I'm, it's not the same. Um, Erin was mentioning your, uh, your upcoming work, and that's where we will yeah, to conclude. Yeah, um, so I'm going to start working in January in Con uh, Concordia University in Montreal, in uh, uh, Kanawage, sorry, Kanyangeha Mohawk territory. And um, it's a two year postdoc on creating a digital archive access viewing platform for moving image and interactive media VR work by indigenous makers from across the Great Ocean region and across the Americas, and to have poetic critical responses in our languages. And so it might be like four or five communities have a site within that for the first year and then expand out. But um, the future is not colonized, so why don't we situate ourselves there? <laughs> Thanks. Announcements. Uh, uh, I request for Ashish to make one of the two. I'll make one. Can I see a raise of hands for how many of you would like to join in the KCC trip today at 5:30? Hey, everybody. Okay, I'll just tell you what it is so you know. It is uh, um, soon to be launched uh, art center in the city. And at this point, we're just looking at their building and to think about possibilities of what could happen there. They're open to proposals from anybody who would like to propose. So it's really not that you're going to see an exhibition or anything um, in terms of, uh, you know, you're, you're viewing the building. So if I have a sense, sorry, I didn't, uh, I answered your question, I didn't have a look. So we need to tell them the, the sort of number of people, yeah. Uh, near Fortis Hospital which is about uh, 20 minutes away from here. The Ruby, Ruby, uh, the Ruby, yeah, so Kajba ahead of that, 
Yeah? Uh, sorry, can I, I'm sorry again. Can you please uh, raise your hand? Okay, so we need that bus. Otherwise, they would have sent us a car. So they will. So their plan is they will send us a bus here um, at 5.30 and then drop uh, the presenters to Park Hotel. And some of you can get dropped in, the, you know, in, in a convenient place so you can get your local transport to wherever else you have to go. The uh, it's, I think they, they plan to have this whole thing for about an hour. So you should be back at Park Hotel by maybe 7 or so. Uh, 7.30 latest maybe. Um, tomorrow after the hub. Ashish and some friends have planned uh, a nice uh, trip, but I would like him to come and talk about it. Before that, come, come, Ashish. It's 1.41 already, so can we meet at 2.45 here? We, uh, for sh the people in Sharjah who are following us, we will reconvene in one hour from now. And before that, this message. See, if you were here, uh, friends in Sharjah, what are the possibilities you could have? <laughs> uh, this is... Uh this is something that I did about two or three years ago. Uh, so this is going to be tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, I'm going to do a walking tour of the Park Street Cemetery. The Park Street Cemetery is probably the earliest, well, it's the second earliest archaeological site in the city. It's part of the Canal uh, British city, and it's also uh, stunningly interesting. So at 9 a.m., at the Park Hotel lobby, I will wait. Whoever wants to accompany me will walk down to all across Park Street to the Park Street Cemetery. Should be about an hour, an hour of walk. So um, after lunch, uh, we're going to have uh, the last presenter for today, Shumon Bazar, who is joining us live uh, from Sharjah. And then uh, at the Sharjah Art Foundation, and there will be also Murtaza Wali, who is co-moderating the group discussion in terms of the Q&A that will take place uh, thereafter. So please come back and um, have a good break.